We come to the second day of this uh, monthly meeting, and uh, we have appropriately called it the Wisdom Studio, and we have eight wise men who are going to give us their taken considerations on various aspects of uh, and philosophies of uh, Nia Basti. I'm delighted to have uh, uh, my good friend Seb, you know, Sebastian Parrot, as my co chair. And we're extremely happy and we're delighted to welcome uh, all our international faculty. We, re we recognize that it's well past their dinner time, closer to their bedtime, and we really appreciate uh, their presence on this uh, live. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to First of all, invite uh, Seth um, to give his uh, first talk, Managing uh, the Cost of uh, in Advancing the Technology. Seth, the floor is all yours. Well, I, I assume you're going to play it. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm going to play the, uh, play the, uh, the talk, uh, Seth. So, so the plan Even, huh? is yes. that we will be able to play all yes, yes, yes. The, four, uh, the four talks, and at the end of the fourth talk, that's the last one by uh, Stephen Howell. We will have we'll break for some deliberations and uh, questions and answers. And following oh, that, uh, oh, we leave it behind this question. You're very welcome to stay on. Uh, but if the hours are really late yes, yes. and you want to log out, we totally understand. So thank you again for your uh, availability for this meeting. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. Good morning again from afar. Advances in total hip and knee replacement technologies have heretofore been largely driven by corporate marketing hype. Each seeming advancement accompanied by a cost increase, often out in front of peer-reviewed reports documenting their efficacy or not. As this slide suggests, healthcare expenditure in the United States as a percentage of gross domestic product approaches 17%, higher than any other reporting country, and rising at an unsustainable rate. It is interesting by comparison that spending in the United Kingdom and other countries is markedly less. As a contemporary technology example, consider the growing use of ceramic femoral heads in primary total hip arthroplasty. The question to consider is can an upcharge of $350 for ceramic femoral head be justified? The answer to this question lies in an appreciation of whether the introduction of ceramic technology modifies the potential for readmission and revision arthroplasty in the intermediate to long term. According to data presented in the 2022 Australian National Joint Registry Replacement Registry, the four leading causes of primary hip arthroplasty failure requiring revision are infection, dislocation, instability, fracture, and loosening which constitute 87.5% of the reasons for revision. Appreciating these four failure modes individually, it is well established that decreasing the articular bearing couple wear rates decreases the potential for osteolytic response leading to loosening and potentiating fracture. This is dramatically appreciated where ceramic is employed as derived from simulators. This graph depicts an almost 50 year timeline dating from the days of the Charlie low friction arthroplasty to today's ceramic ceramic endpoint. Further, the utility of ceramics enables large heads to be employed to avoid the potential for dislocation, not different from a cobalt chrome equivalent, but again, assisting the reduction of wear debris generation. Historically, alumina and subsequently zirconia Ceramic hip components were introduced as low friction arthroplasty bearing alternatives as far back as the 1970s, with their first clinical use attributed to professors Botin, Middlemeyer, and Sedell, and gained FDA approval in 1982. 
However, the ceramic couples were not without their challenges. The early drawbacks to their use have been attributed to poor implant design, acetabular component loosening, low quality ceramic, resulting in the regeneration and fracture and significant sensitivity, alignment sensitivity, all of which dampened enthusiasm, ultimately leading to their abandonment in the United States. Their contemporary popularity lies in appreciation of evolutionary improvements that have been made both to the materials and their certification prior to in vivo use. These include minimization of impurities to reduce potential stress rises, reduction of grain boundaries to substantially improve material strength and fracture toughness, inclusion of zirconia, strontium, and chromium additives to improve strength and inhibit crack propagation, proof testing of all individual components to overcome the potential for early fracture. Despite these now claimed manufacturing improvements, the proof of the pudding lies in earlier clinical reports of mid to long-term outcome studies. Utilizing alumina on alumina bearings, the overall survival rate has exceeded 95% with virtually no osteolysis, fracture, or squeaking. With the increasing use of hip replacement in younger, more active patient populations, there is a defined need for bearing solutions of longevity. Correspondingly, the reported sales of ceramic femoral heads in the United States has increased consecutively and in 2021 was reported to have exceeded 70%. This is indicative of surgeon confidence in their employ. Beyond their reported clinical longevity as bearing surfaces, the realization that the majority of contemporary femoral stems are modular suggests that metal head stem taper interactions resulting in fretting corrosion can be a contributing cause of revision. The increasing use of ceramic heads poses the following question. Can ceramic heads reduce the prospect of head tape of fretting corrosion? A series of retrieval observations presented by Kurtz suggests that this may indeed be the case, which is further supplemented by a most recent publication from this group. The use of ceramic femoral heads not only reduces the burden of polyethylene debris, but also cobalt and chromium, as well as their ions, all of which have been associated with adverse local tissue reactions, leading to revision total hip arthroplasty. <laughs> Lastly, could bearing surface choice influence periprosthetic joint infraction? A study on a total of more than 10,500 primary total hip arthroplasty procedures with a minimum of two year follow-up produced the following incidence of confirmed periprosthetic joint infection. These results suggest that the employ of, of a ceramic bearing surface may play a role in decreasing the potential for infection following primary total hip arthroplasty. After review of this available data for ceramic bearings, the potential for reduction of healthcare dollars spent through advancing technologies would clearly suggest that it is better to pay me now than to pay orders of magnitude later if in fact the revision total hip arthroplasty can be avoided. At the end of the day, arguments have been advanced suggesting that the use of ceramic femoral heads contributes to the long-term durability of primary total hip arthroplasty procedures reducing the need for revision. Although there is a cost increase associated with their employ in primary hip reconstruction, avoiding the prospect of significant revision costs reduces the financial burden on the healthcare system. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Um, request you to stay on and we'll, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be having the, the discussion at the end of our talk. Um, it's a great you. pleasure now to you. lay out uh, the second talk in the Lisbon studio, which is uh, going to be delivered by none other than my very dear friend, uh, Dr. Bob Booth. And he's going to talk to us about techniques, technology, and teamwork 
robotics that really matter. Okay. Hello, my name is Robert Booth, and I'm speaking to you from Philadelphia in the United States. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to address your Congress, and also particularly to Ashok Rajapal, whom I greatly respect and from whom I have learned a great deal. I have been um, I have been uh, operating and doing total knees for almost 50 years, and I'm approaching 50,000 in number. Uh, I have been accused of uh, psychosclerosis or hardening of the attitudes, and indeed my <laughs> perspective is historical. I am one of the perhaps only living surgeons who has operated with the original giants of joint surgery, John Charnley, uh, Maurice Mueller, and of course, John Insull. So I'd like to rephrase Ashok's title for me and ask whether not the man or the machine, but the archer or the arrow is the issue. If the arrow represents the prosthetic components, we are uh, almost at an asymptote, I think, in design and materials and changes. And that part leaves little opportunity for improvement. Some changes have occurred, such as uh, making asymmetrical tibial trays, which eliminated the number one error in knee replacement, which was internal rotation. Not much else is left to do with the parts. The total knee has been an enormous success and one of the greatest inventions of mankind. It is also now a global uh, device, which is put in by the millions around the world. The uh, the ingenuity for this came largely from the English and the Europeans. Uh, the Americans and the Germans are responsible, I think, for many of the technologic advances and their production of the devices. And a lot of the experience and the uh, application of this in reality has come from your enormous population in India and Asia in the laboratory of life. If you think, on the other hand, that the archer is the most important issue, then be aware that there is an enormous range of ability and dexterity and three-dimensional vision among surgeons. And the goal, of course, is to find some way to narrow the gap between a regular carpenter and John Insels of this world. You can't make any instrument that a surgeon can't use to make a mistake. These are some of the knees I've seen over the years uh, with, uh, as you can see on the top right, a little reverse slope uh, in the middle, uh, every augment in the OR stack to try and achieve balance. The tibia put in 180 degrees backwards. The patellar buttons for some reason seems to be a problem. Here on the bottom left is one that's even on the wrong side of the patella. And one of my favorites is of course a hip surgeon who confronted with a valgus knee did what he did best and put in an endoprosthesis. Uh, we can make anything work badly. And many people just simply don't have the ability to do things with simple instruments. Uh, this computer sat in one of the ORs in my hospital, largely unused, and uh, I didn't realize the sign didn't mean don't touch, it meant that it was for people with bad hands. If you like a statistical evidence, just remember that 49% of orthopedists are below average and always will be. So it's neither of the first two. I think the real issue is the bow, is the instrument that interfaces between the archer and the arrow. Our original instruments were soft tissue balancing and shorted alignment. We then went to Dunn-Burton instruments, which use intramedullary alignment at the expense of soft tissue balancing. And one of the hopes of robots and computers was that they would balance the two. Bony alignment plus soft tissue input at every decision point would be the ideal for any instrument. And indeed, there have been instruments such as the VSTAT, which had a short life, but combined both those principles of tensioning and uh, intramedullary alignment. 
But the goal of instruments is to make things simpler, not to make them more complicated, which seems to be the trend today. Um, the instruments we have are getting more and more complex rather than less, and I'm not sure they're the help they should be. Now, I'm not trying to pose as a Luddite, uh, like this gentleman from the uh, 19th century in Britain whose followers destroyed new inventions so that they wouldn't lose their job in the Industrial Revolution. In fact, 30 years ago this year, I got the Nice Society Prize for creating a balancing device to be implanted as a trial in the knee using a film and a computer. This was unfortunately not popular clinically because nobody wanted to deal with a computer 30 years ago, including myself. We're also using uh, at the smart knee now, PIQ from Zimmer, which has within it a device to allow us to monitor the patient's stride and balance and motion. This I think is an advance. The question for you all is whether or not to use robotics uh, in your own practice. Uh, the putative value of robotics was that it would shorten the distance between the Gaussian distributions of error. So you hear see in Sparman's article that he indeed had uh, fewer outriders, but of course his range of error without an outrider was 13 degrees. Clearly that's too wide a range for anybody. And the promise was that if you got the alignment better and reduced the outriders, you would get more rapid recovery, uh, better outcomes, etc. The difficulty is that there's a disconnect, and this has not been the case, that outriders are not, um, uh, uh, even though they are reduced, the uh, connection between perfect alignment has not been shown to improve clinical function long term. I personally prefer the mechanical axis, but be aware there are three axes that people can choose, and the kinematic design that's come about recently, I think, is yet another mistake, as putting knees in varus requires that you either leave the medial side lateral or that you internally rotate the component. This was the problem with the PCA knee of Hungerford and Krakow. So you have in your alignment armamentarium several options, one to use the ligaments, two to use an intermedullary device, three to use computers and navigation, or lastly to choose robotics. I used to visit John Insel quite frequently and one of his commandments was not to believe knees in varus. I think that still applies. But it's not all about the bone. That's one of the problems is that we focus exclusively on bone. The uh, ideal would be to have at every step a bony and a soft tissue option to create alignment and balance simultaneously. The key issue is balance. That's the thing that determines a great knee from an average knee. And uh, balance trumps actual alignment. The problem is it's hard to quantify because we don't have strain gauges in our instruments. Tension is not the same as pressure or displacement and we have very variable ligamentous laxity in our patient population, such as the women with rear bottom. In a soft tissue bearing uh, uh, mode, in a cam type joint, the joint should be snug in flexion and loose in extension. But because we have shifted our strategy to doing extension first and then flexion, we are now producing a, a generation of knees with flexion and stability uh, and I think that sequence has, needs to go back to the way it originally was. I personally would rather have a knee that's totally well balanced, but three degrees out of alignment, than a knee that's perfectly aligned, but has three millimeters of laxity. So is there something out there to help us? Is there some uh, instrument that will create that soft tissue balancing that's so critical? Well, there are many devices out there on the market these days, and many of you have seen all. Uh, some claim to create a balance, but without a strain gauge, they are not, they're measuring displacement and pressure and not truly tension. There are places where robots, I think, are very helpful, such as spots that are difficult to reach, like a prostate, or spots that are dangerous to reach, like a pedicle with a screw implantation. 
but a total knee is a subcutaneous uh, operation and there's not a great deal of danger or difficulty with access. So really this is not a penicillin moment for total knees to create a robot. The literature is very interesting. It's very soft and uh, inconclusive, but largely even great studies like this with a 13 year follow-up, but a great number of patients show no difference between robotic and, and conventional instrument knees. Note the 2% infection rate as well. We need to be aware that these instruments, uh, robotics in particular, take longer and, flex, and infection and TVT uh, are linearly related to the length of the surgery. Uh, 50 years ago, the little robot in the center, I would argue, could do everything that our current robots do today. And our tools are getting more complex unnecessarily. I don't think that a mallet is a particularly difficult instrument to use. But there are now mallets that are pneumatic. One company's leaks, the other looks like a machine gun. And I think this is over technology in knee replacement. So what are the rules? If you have a new idea or a new device, one should wait at least two years until it appears in a peer reviewed journal by a non-designer. If you follow those three simple uh, filters, you would avoid all the complications we've seen recently. There is little difference in clinical outcome for any of the robotic or conventional technology, as you see in this article from some years ago. At the recent Knee Society interim meeting, a surgeon I respect enormously, Faris Haddad, presented a series of patients done with robotic and conventional instruments. And the only difference that came from all of that was that the patients with the robotic knee had less awareness of their knee, whatever that means. No difference at all in complications or need for manipulations or outcomes. He also and the discussion talked of a sham robotic uh, uh, test that he did, actually putting in pins, doing the same OR setup, using the same protocols, uh, but not using the robot, and showing that there was no difference between that and the knees in which the robot was used. So just the magic of the name robot is not enough to improve the results. We can reduce our outliers, but I think that makes weak surgeons <laughs> average. It also may make great surgeons average. And one of the other interesting articles that uh, came from that Knee Society meeting was the residency training perception, where 222 residents surveyed about their robotic uh, joint uh, education felt that 70% uh, had received the training, 50% of the knees they did were robotic, but 29 felt, only 29% felt robotics improved their result. 53% felt that it was done largely for marketing and 25% felt that the uh, constrained knees they did, did were worse. Uh, most felt their teachers had a fiscal interest and that's why they were being taught robotics to begin with. So the real value may well be the marketing and certainly there, every little hospital in our area has a marketing sign and it does attract patients we also have podiatrists who will cut your toenails and do a pedicure with a laser. I think these are equivalent arguments. It's far better in my mind to under-promise but over-deliver than the opposite. And if you think that putting a, a computer or a CD or a robot into your OR is going to make your life better, I think you're naive. I think a robot in the OR, it, to me, is like the electronic medical record in the clinic. Enormous frustrating and not particularly helpful. It also requires that you have someone who knows how to manage these devices and so the uh, people who may have a very different view of the world may be the most important person in the OR, not the surgeon. So to make a difference, a difference has to be has to make a difference or it doesn't make a difference and it would appear that there's not much difference with robots. The economics are, need to be considered. The robots cost a million dollars a piece. They're not reimbursed by the insurers, at least in America. You need an IT person available to help work it. And they're not even endorsed by the academy. 
So the return on investment is really measured in patients, not in outcomes. So, so far, there's no significant difference, at least from what I can perceive. You need to ask yourself, how much help do you need and can you afford it? Some, like me, are too comfortable to change. Some, like change, seek their comfort. And there's no question that the world of robotics and artificial intelligence will create magical new devices in the future. But I think the next great leap is not going to be robotic, but biologic. I think that either stem cell technology or cloning or some other new concept will create a far better knee than continuing to put metal and plastic in. If there is ever a, a Nobel Prize for total knee replacement, I think it will go to somebody who has a biologic answer and not a prosthetic answer. Thank you. Officers. So now we're going to move to the next talk from uh, Seth. He's going to talk about is critical testing predictive of in vivo performance? Yes, yes. It's a very important topic as well to understand what there is influence in our patients. And pre clinical testing is something that is a part of the evaluation of our patients as well. Yeah. So keep your question for the end of the the middle part of the session, and we will uh, do discussion uh, is after the next two talks. Good afternoon from afar. The answer to the question posed by the title is a qualified yes. Current requirements embraced by regulatory bodies, including the FDA in the United States, seek the ultimate goal of assuring the safety and effectiveness of medical devices during short, intermediate, and long-term clinical use. The following remarks focus on the performance of polyethylene in total knee designs. To appreciate the limitations of in vitro laboratory testing, it is important to realize that it is not just design, material, and manufacturing choices which influence outcome, but is inclusive of both patient factors and surgical variables. Soft tissue interruption and repair, component selection and placement, all contribute to the in vivo integrity of total knee designs. The limitations of contemporary wear testing standards are that only ideal mounting and loading conditions are simulated, which exclude apparent gait patterns resulting from skeletal deformity, component placement and limb alignment, as well as inconsistent loading patterns, which occur in stop-start motions, extended rest periods, and micro-separation. They do not replicate a true in vivo environment, although attempts at temperature control and lubrication through both ringers and serum often inclusive antibiotics are utilized. They require long testing times, often out to 10 million cycles of load application for multiple specimens that have been preconditioned through accelerated aging. And because of the above are expensive in their conduct. They also have shown poor clinical correlation, largely because of unpredictable patient and surgical variables which influence retrieval findings. As is appreciated, polyethylene damage observed from knee implant retrievals demonstrates that the determinants of abrasive wear may be characterized by both sliding distance and surface stress distribution, which is visualized in the following graph from Rose and Goldfarb, which describes a nonlinear relationship between increasing contact pressure and resulting polyethylene weight loss due to wear. Traditionally, tibial insert wear is determined through the use of simulators whose both loading and kinematic pathways elicit wear volumes which are representative of anticipated in vivo articulation. In this regard, multi-station servo-hydraulic and electromechanical implant simulators are employed. As has been indicated, their employ require long-term in vitro evaluation are costly in their enterprise and unfortunately do not always align with retrieval patterns. I am sharing with you my early experience 
in evaluating the municipal bearing wear volumes required by FDA to establish safety and performance for the first device of this type. To omit these current physical testing standards for knee implant systems, computational stress analysis and kinematic simulation have been developed as advancing evaluative technologies. Ongoing studies reveal that the contact areas and stresses that are associated with polymer insert damage in high flexion knee designs occur during daily activities, which include stair ascent, chair rise, and kneel rise. Clinical evidence of this may be appreciated from the seven year retrieval of a fixed plateau design which flexed to 115 degrees at the time of discharge. Knee plateau damage is noted in the posterior medial quadrant of this right knee through surface abrasion, cracking, and subsurface delamination. To determine surface and subsurface stresses, finite element models are created by measuring the articular surface of implantable quality parts using laser profilometry. Contact areas and stresses on and within the polymer inserts are calculated and photorealistically imaged. Under a standardized body weight, images for the PFC Sigma rotating platform are displayed and provide an indication of areas where damage caused by contact with the femoral component can occur. It is noted that in spine cam designs, contact generally occurs prior to achieving 90 degrees flexion and stresses rise rapidly in magnitude. Additionally, it is appreciated that the footprint of the contact stress distributions overlie and influence subsurface stress volumes. They represent a visual inference for the potential of material delamination and cracking, a dominant mechanism of failure in knee retrievals. Where this conventional polyethylene retrieval demonstrates what I would describe as primary and secondary damage patterns. An example of the consequence of poor fit between the femoral component and the proximal surface of a mobile bearing plateau as predicted by its finite element model is displayed. The poor proximal fit propagates to the distal interface, creating contact patterns along the edge. The amplifying effect of prescribed kinematics in a laboratory wear simulation specimen can be appreciated in this photograph from Walker of the distal surface <clears throat> of the same design. Comparison indicates that the finite element model is capable of accurately predicting locations of abrasion. The next step we have undertaken is kinematic simulation through the use of a dynamic musculoskeletal modeling system which offers a constraining soft tissue envelope with active flexor and extensor muscle groups driving activity. The outputs of the software are animations and plots of the kinematic pathway. The resulting animations and plots characterize the motion of the femoral component relative to the tibial insert in comparison to that of the normal knee in a deep knee bend activity. The virtual components are implanted in the knee sim joint space per the manufacturer's surgical procedure. The plot on the left illustrates anterior, which are positive, and posterior, which are negative, translation of the medial and lateral condyles as a function of knee flexion angle. The animation on the right depicts component orientation from a superior view. The reference points contribute to understanding the relative motion of the femoral component for this design. The figure in the upper left visualizes an accumulation of contact areas during the activity cycles of walking gait and deep knee bend derived from kinematic simulation for a Duracon total knee system. The plot in the upper right describes the damage patterns from a series of 17 retrieved tibial inserts of this Duracon design provided by Scott Banks and Melinda Harmon. The progressive darkened areas suggest a commonality of damage locations amongst the retrievals. 
The lower image is an overlay plot that visualizes the prediction of the NISIM model and closely matches the abrasive wear scar damage observed in the clinical retrievals. At the end of the day, two evolving iterative computational technologies have been described, mm -hmm. which currently augment traditional physical wear testing standards accepted by the FDA and other regulatory bodies. The interconnecting of physical testing with these computational technologies assists the design of contemporary total knees devices, assures the quality control of manufactured components, and serves as in vitro predictors of material damage locations, which can be compared to the vice retrievals. In conclusion, the answer to the question posed by the title is that preclinical testing assists in assuring the safety and effectiveness of contemporary knee designs through short, intermediate, and long-term clinical use. Thank you. Now we're going to. Now it's my great pleasure to welcome Stephen Noel, who has been facing a, a, a lot of uh, difficult times during the past 20 years, but that. Uh, 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 that's fine. Help us to understand better how the knee can function. We see the knee in three D now better, and uh, we have been able to move to different targets in alignment. And uh, Steve is going to talk about kinematic alignment and unrestricted kinematic alignment. My name is Stephen Howell, and I want to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to speak about unrestricted kinematic alignment going strong. I'd like to cover three talking points. One is that the principle of unrestricted kinematic alignment is to resurface the prearthritic knee and restore the native trapezoidal flexion space. When you do kinematic alignment with manual instruments, it is more accurate than robotics. And the third one is that relative to mechanical alignment, Unrestricted kinematic alignment has better outcomes, comparable 7, 10, and 13 year implant survival, and negligible risk of varus loosening. So let's look at the principle of kinematic alignment. It's a simple concept. The goal is to set the components coincident to the patient's prearthritic joint lines of the knee, which co-aligns the three rotational axes of the knee with those of the components. So let's look at a schematic of four views of the femur. The green transverse line is the axis about which the tibia flexes and extends. The magenta line is the axis about which the patella flexes and extends. And the longitudinal axis that's vertical to these two lines is the one about which the tibia internally and externally rotates. These three axes are either parallel or perpendicular to the patient's prearthritic joint lines. So it follows that if you want the femoral and tibial components to restore the kinematic axles, they have to resurface the knee. And when you do so, you get medial ball and socket kinematics like the native knee. Now, arthroscopists know that the flexion space of the native knee is trapezoidal and not rectangular, which is the goal of gap balancers and functional alignment surgeons. You know this when you look at the lateral compartment with the knee in a little bit of flexion, the gap is always bigger than the medial compartment. With kinematic alignment, we want to maintain that relationship. And it's important to do so, as shown in this schematic, where in extension, we like to have a tight rectangular extension space with equal medial and lateral gaps. But as shown in this plot, with flexion angle on the x-axis and varus valgus laxity on the y-axis, in extension, there's very little play. But when you flex the knee, then you get a trapezoidal space. And the lateral side opens more than the medial side, and it progressively increases to 90 degrees. And so we want to maintain in kinematic alignment that normal laxity pattern of the knee and not tighten the lateral side down trying to get a rectangular space. Now kinematic alignment with manual instruments is actually more accurate than robotics for setting the femoral component. Here's an example of how caliper kinematic alignment restores the patient's prearthritic alignment in a severe varus knee. This is what the radiograph looks like, but all the ligaments are fine, of course, except for the ACL. And when you look at this knee as it's exposed, you can see that in full extension, there's usually very little bone wear because the knee doesn't fully extend. 
same inflection. So we can compensate for cartilage loss by referencing the bone and adding two millimeters back for cartilage wear. And so in this projection of a, a different knee, where there's a varus wear medially and cartilage is missing medially, we have a worn paddle on the medial side with a two millimeter buildup to correct for the loss. And this guide is drilled directly to bone, which plans and executes the distal cut at the same time. And then we go ahead and we measure the pieces we take off. And we want the thickness of the pieces to equal that of the femoral components condyle after we add a millimeter back for the curve of the blade and two millimeters back for cartilage wear when present. We do the same with posterior referencing guide and it too is bolted to the femur so that we reference and plan and execute the cuts without using any images whatsoever. In a varus knee, we'd like both posterior cuts to be seven millimeters thick when there's no cartilage loss. When you add a millimeter back, it equals the thickness of the femoral condyle of the component, which is eight millimeters. The total time to, from exposure to achieving these four cuts in this case was eight minutes, so it's very efficient. Interoperatively, we record these verify, uh, caliper verified resection thicknesses on a worksheet, so we can go back and check our work during the case if we get a little bit confused. These values are also added to the operative report because the cuts determine the outcome of the knee. And when they're correct, you get high forgotten joint score and Oxford score and Womack score. And when you don't, the scores are less. Caliper Verified K quickly restored this patient's function. Here he is at six weeks. He underwent no formal physical therapy. There's his range of motion. And when we look at the post-operative radiograph, we want to always check the other side and compare it to it because our goal is to restore the patient's prearthritic joint line and the opposite side can be often used as a comparison. So we want the distal lateral femoral angle, proximal tibial angle to be the same and then that gives some validation radiographically we achieved our results. Now kinematic alignment with manual instruments is more accurate than robotics. This paper was published looking at a negligible effect of surgeon experience on the accuracy and time to perform unrestricted caliper verified KA with manual instruments published in 2022. If we look at the femoral resections, distal medial, distal lateral, posterior medial, posterior lateral, and we look at the 261 knees done by the 14 surgeons, you can see the deviation from target was zero with a standard deviation of about 0.2.3 millimeters. When we compare the deviation from target for those same femoral resections with a robot, the deviation is much greater averaging about 0.5 to 0.6 millimeters, and a standard deviation is two to three times higher. If we look at the Rosa robot, it's the same. The standard deviation, uh, the mean difference is about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 millimeters, with a standard deviation also two times higher. So if you want an accurate surgical technique, you can get rid of the images, go right to the bone, and use manual instruments, and have an efficient way to set the femoral component kinematically correct. Now, relative to mechanical alignment, unrestricted kinematic alignment has been shown in multiple studies to have better outcomes, comparable 7, 10, and 13-year implant survival, and negligible risk of varus loosening. 11 of 13 randomized trials, case control and case series, of bilateral TKA report KA in some measure is better than MA. And you can start with Dossett's study in 2014 in the U.S., moved to Calier's study, 2017 in Germany, and then to Japan in 17, Australia 19, Australia again in 2020, Japan 2020, Australia 2020, Germany 2020, USA 2021, Israel 2021, and now back to the USA in 2022 at special surgery, where Albulik showed superior outcomes with K versus MA in their cohorts. I believe this is global validation of kinematic alignment. And I also believe it's the tip of the iceberg of what is to come. Now, if we look at the revision rate, this study looked at the, showed a similar revision rate of KA using PSI compared to all other total knee arthroplasties, results from the Australian and New Zealand joint replacement registries. And this was the Otis Med knee. And at seven year follow-up, the KA TKAs had a similar revision rate as all other TKAs of the same brand implant, which were presumably placed with mechanical alignment. My own study looked at the 10-year implant survivorship of unrestricted KA and compared to other cohorts, which is not a level one study, but is better than MATKA. Our results at 10 years showed a 98.5% aseptic survival of 220 KAs performed in 2007. The results won't change much. We're almost done the 15-year evaluation at present. But you look at the 10-year follow-up for MA done by Bonner, the revision rate's a little bit higher and the implant survival is also 
uh, not quite as high with Perret's study when you back work the data to 2010. Now, finally, Dawson, in this past week, just published the results of his randomized trial with long-term follow-up, once again with Yotis Knee, and their conclusion was that kinematic alignment demonstrates excellent mean 13-year results comparable to MATK with similar reoperations, complications, and patient-reported outcome measures long-term. RSA analysis shows that there's a negligible tibial component migration risk with up to 10 degrees of so-called Barris tibial alignment. And in this particular study, which I'll share with you in a moment, we used tantalum markers, placed eight of them in the tibia, and used model-based RSA to determine migration of the base plate. This is the proximal medial tibial angle that we measured. And if we look at the results from the paper, you can see that the proximal tibial angle on the x-axis with more varus to the right and one year maximum total point motion or measurement of migration, you can see that most of our patients in this cohort were so-called varus outliers according to the mechanical alignment criteria. And yet there was lower migration as the varus increased. And that's because of the superior soft tissue balancing achieved with kinematic alignment that cannot be achieved with other techniques. So there's negligible tibia component migration with up to 10 degree virus tibia component based on RSA and based on 7, 10, and 13 year follow-up studies. And in this RSA study, low and non-progressive tibial base plate migration over one year in 35 patients with unrestricted KA with a medial conforming design alleviates any concern that unrestricted KA increases the risk of tibial component loosening. So to summarize, I think the take home message is based on these international evidence-based studies and the accuracy of manual instruments with caliper, caliper verification, isn't it time to consider that unrestricted kinematic alignment is the gold standard total knee arthroplasty procedure. Robots are essential for non-physiologic knee replacement techniques like functional alignment which chases rectangles with the undesirable consequence of laterally over-tightening the flexion space that in our view should remain trapezoidal like in the native knee. You can scan this link to get a variety of educational information on unrestricted caliper verified KA. You can do it with your phone. I'll pause here for 10 seconds or 15 seconds or so to let you get your phone out and scan this link and it takes you to our publications, presentations, uh, and other uh, interesting uh, topics that you can download and share with your friends. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, my partners in this quest to better understand told knee arthroplasty, distinguished Professor Maury Hull, uh, who which I've worked for over 30 years in the space of knee ACL reconstruction, meniscal transplant, and told knee replacement, and my partner, Dr. Alex Nedipil. Thank you, Steve, and uh, thank you, Seth, uh, for the very erudite talks. So, as, as I promised, we will take a break uh, for you, gentlemen, to address all the questions from the gathering here, and then we make the choice of you staying on or getting back to bed or dinner. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Yeah. yeah. Uh, are there any uh, techniques to find out the where in normal practice, routine practice, how you uh, find out the where of the implant? Is there any technology? What technology do you use? Is that to your set? Yeah. Said, so the question is, is there a methodology that you can measure where uh, and what technology are you using for that? Is that a, routine, sorry, is that a question? In routine practice. <coughs> in routine practice. I, I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure. I, 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 I understood the question, but is the question have to do with measuring where in components? Could you yes, repeat the that, question? Sorry. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. I can answer that if you want. Um, yeah. You know, while you're catching your thoughts, Seth. I mean, in clinical practice, 
when there's polyethylene wear, it's sort of become self-evident over the span of a few yeah. months. A patient's yeah. doing pretty well, and then over three or four months, they they notice maybe a little bit of effusion, a little discomfort, sure. and the next thing you know, they start to slip. And it's usually, as Seth showed in his uh, presentation, posterior edge wear of the poly, which when the ACL is missing, causes the knee to sort of pivot out, if you will, like an ACL deficient knee. And so they may present early on with just discomfort and effusion, and then subsequently they 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 then as they get more worn, uh, they yeah. With you, you you also have to you have to recognize that the manifestation of wear debris, uh, as well as the ions and uh, metal particulate that are associated with release because of because of uh, an articular motion process on the load, uh, often manifests itself to the development of osteolytic response. And that is really the foretaste and forerunner of what potentiates loosening and potentiates potential fracture. So the, the question is you absolutely can measure wear. And really what you often see, what you will see clinically is the manifestation of uh, non-biologic bodies uh, being non-digestible. Uh, and as the result, you end up with osteolytic type responses. I have a question for both Bob Booth and for, uh, not a question, but I found the, uh, both Dr. Howells and Dr. Booth's commentaries, particularly the robots, very interesting. I think both came at it from somewhat different uh, perspectives, but I think both would have, both ended up questioning the validity or the extreme benefit of robots. And uh, I suspect that uh, the jury is out uh, still on whether or not we're going to see long-term advantages in terms of enhanced patient satisfaction and long-term clinical performance. Um, and I don't know if I interpreted what you've said, uh, um, um, Steve, as well as Robert, but um, um, I too have my suspicions about the long-term validity of robotics as they exist today. Well, my, as I said earlier, I think, uh, Dr. Perrette, you were kind enough to say it's been a 20 year odyssey with this KA. And so, you know, I look <laughs> at it with a different lens, if you will, than others, because my experience is now, I don't know, 7,000 knees with this technique. And, uh, and, and I will say that early on, when we did the PSI guides, I mean, the thing that made the difference was the alignment, because when we did MA versus K, the results were better. So I think if you're going to do, if you're going to do the robot and you continue down the pathway of mechanical alignment, if you're going to tighten down the lateral side of the knee routinely by doing gap balancing. You can expect that you won't change the outcome any different than what you had with uh, manual instruments for navigation. And so I think that the fundamental thing will be the change in the targets for alignment. And when you looked at the kinematic axes I laid out early, earlier in the schematics, they have no bearing on the femoral head or the ankle. The femoral head and the ankle have nothing to do with how to put a knee in. It has nothing to do with the longevity of the knee. And it has nothing to do with the function of the knee. What determines the function of the knee is how much bone you take off from the femur and whether the amount you take off matches the amount of metal you're gonna put back after you account for the cartilage wear and uh, the kerf loss from the, from the, from the bone cut. And, uh, and once you resurface the femur right, then you just gap balance the tibial cut in extension to restore a tight rectangular space. And you naturally restore the trapezoidal flexion space. And when you measure the forces, either in the lab as we've done in vitro or in the OR with the Verisense, you restore native forces. So if you, if you consider, and Bob Booth was right, you know, about, uh, about balancing the knee, the tension in the ligament tells you nothing. The gaps tell you nothing. It's really the force in the compartments that tell you whether the knee is balanced. And we know from Verstraight in Journal Biomechanics, which many of us don't read, that the forces, medial and lateral, are always a little higher, medial and lateral through the motion arc. Mm -hmm. And they're highest in extension. And as soon as you flex the knee, they, they decline gradually to 90 degrees. And that's because the trapezoidal space exists in flexion. When you change that, then you end up with a tight knee, people with lateral side pain and unpleasantness. And uh, it, it's really been a fun odyssey over the last 20 years. There's a lot of stuff we got going on that I can't quite share tonight, but uh, I look forward to in the next year or two about thermal component design and so forth. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun.
Stephen, uh, this is Ashok Raj Gopal, a brilliant uh, presentation as always. I, I'm going to put the panel on the patients and I, I'm going to put this question to you deliberately to try and provoke you. How would you react to, to numerous articles out in literature and very reputed journals which actually validate and maintain that the outcomes of the kinematically aligned knees and mechanically aligned knees are similar. So while there is a body of evidence that actually says the K is better, there is also an equivalent body of evidence that says mechanically aligned knees do as well. What would be your comment on that statement, Steve? Well, I think that it is, I think that it is related to several things. One, is the biggest differences will occur when you use unrestricted KA versus MA. As soon as you do restricted kinematic alignment, you're not doing kinematic alignment. And so you end up taking knees that really, when you get done placing the components, aren't that much different uh, in the mechanical line group than the KA group. So the bigger the deformities, the, the, the greater variety, the bigger differences you see with K because we don't have to do the ligament releases with it. So I think having studies that don't, do unrestricted K and comparing can lead to no difference. The other thing is, is the outcome score. I mean, if you're comparing Oxford knee score, Womack score, Q score, everything else, you're going to not detect it many times. The only test that really detects the difference in high, high measure of cases is the forgotten joint score. So when you're not testing the forgotten, if you're doing kinematic alignment and not recording the forgotten joint score, then you're going to miss the chance of picking it up, at least from a quantitative point of view. So the outcome score is a very important determinant. So when you look at some of these studies, you will find that it's restricted KA versus whatever. And that's why I laid out on that uh, presentation, 11 of 13 randomized trials. The one with Simon Young, he used restricted KA. He changed the plans to keep the, line, the, the alignments within a range and he limited the inclusion criteria to small deformities. Once you do it on all deformities, you'll find life is very easy. And it's a very efficient and quick way uh, to do a knee replacement that you can then go back and, and, and look at what you accomplished by measuring those bone resections. When you have a complication, it's primarily tibial side, either your insert thickness is wrong, you mis misdid the varus valgus of the femur, or the cut a you know, collateral ligament by mistake or attenuated it. So, so I think the KA, uh, there's still some confusion out there, but when you're an unrestricted KA person and you do a lot of them, you'll realize that there's a quite a bit of difference in the recovery pace and the overall outcome. Thank you, Steve. guys. Thanks for thanks for the. Ravi Bashal, uh, Ravi, do you want to address that question? You're live now. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Rajgopal. Great to hear your voice after a couple of years here. I hope you're doing well. Um, really enjoyed the presentations. Um, uh, from uh, from Dr. Howell, Dr. Greenwald, um, and Dr. Booth. A, a quick question that I had for the panel, which is something that I've really been turned on to recently, is the following. Um, you know, when we do a hip replacement, we're replacing a ball in a socket with a ball in a socket, all well and good. But to Dr. Booth's point, is it the bow, the archer, or the arrow? Um, seemingly, <laughs> our arrow hasn't really changed very much in the past three decades. Uh, Dr. Booth rightly pointed out that we have an asymmetric tibia now, which is, which is advantageous. But be interested to see the panel's thoughts on innovation and knee designs. Um, frankly, I think that one of our problems is that knee replacements are not designed to move like a normal knee. Um, and, I, and I frankly do believe in, 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 in doing some kinematic alignment on my knees to help with that. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that go into it, but uh, is there room to improve the arrow? Can we make the implants better? Specifically, should we be aiming for implants that are designed to move more like um, our normal knee? And, and probably the easiest way to start that is to say, you know, we have most total knee designs now have paradoxical anterior motion of the lateral femoral condyle initially instead of having lateral rollback. So is there room to improve on the arrow um, and, and where should we be looking with that? So we'd be love to hear the panel's thoughts on that. Well, uh, you want to take that? Um, who, um, yeah, well, you know, I've had a, I've had a, I, I never thought the implant design made a difference. I, I'm going to tell you, nor did the professor and I, because from 80s, from 2006, you know, I did, I don't know, 900 Vanguard CRs, and then I did 1300 triathlon CRs, and then I did 500 Sigma CRs, and I did 2000 Persona CRs. And when you think about all of them, they're all ACL deficient, partial, medial meniscectomized knee replacements. That's what they do. 
and I, I'm keeping the PCL, but the ACL is gone and the medial side is less conforming than uh, the normal meniscus is and the femoral component doesn't match. So that gives you AP play. And then I switched over to a medial ball and socket. It took me a full year because I had trouble looking at it internally rotated more. And it, it, you know, I, I would do the persona in one room in the day, three cases. The other day I, I do the medial ball and socket. And now I'm convinced we have in vivo kinematic studies. We have um, uh, RSA studies using it that you get AP stability because of the posterior lip. So when you increase the posterior lip on the backside of the medial insert, you get AP stability. You get an athletic like knee replacement. The limitation is you can't put that knee in and make it function with mechanical alignment. You have to resurface the joint and that enables you to keep the PCL. So we now have a knee, which I consider, I mean, we, we don't have the old lady's knee anymore. We've got a knee where the 50 year old, the 60 year old that wants to be like a 50 year old and a seven year old wants to be like, see, you can do it and you can deliver it. And I think that's the future. That's going to take me the, my professional time that's left to, to try to ferret all this out. But it's been a tremendous change in my practice that I don't have to really worry about who I'm reconstructing because I have a very good chance that they can get back the stuff they want to do. But it is related to the implant design retaining the ligaments and resurfacing the knee. And when you don't put those three ingredients together, then you end up with some issues. Well, let me, uh, let me chime in here. Uh, I think if you think about the, your question is, can we look forward to more optimal designs than exist right now? Uh, quite frankly, I think we have reached probably the zenith of what I would think in terms of material behavior since we now have enhanced polyethylenes uh, once they're sterilized and packaged appropriately. Uh, and, you know, you, you, you could break it down into what, what do we actually have? We have uh, ACL deficient knees. Um, for the most part, as you pointed out, Steve, the PCL is often intact, not always, but often intact. And knee designs can, are, exist to accommodate uh, either ACL deficiency uh, or and, and with PCL competency or sometimes ACL and PCL deficiency. Uh, we have both fixed, posterior stabilized and mobile bearing knees, uh, all of which serve good functions. But I think I'm going to, I'm going to hive on this as a closing remark uh, as far as I'm concerned, is success in total knee design replacement that is success in total knee replacement really is a triad as far as I'm concerned. It's designed the materials, which I believe uh, have pretty much uh, approached optimization uh, for the clinical conditions they're presented with. It's patient perception of what they can do uh, after the uh, implantation. Oftentimes uh, patients forget that they're not going to be teenagers or runners like they used to be and in surgeon proficiency. And from my perspective, whether it's anatomic, kinematic, uh, or mechanical, um, uh, proficiency rests with the surgeon. It's obvious where Steve has come down, and he has found tremendous advantage uh, in the uh, kinematic approach. Um, I'm not quite sure Bob Booth would totally agree with that. But um, nevertheless, from my perspective, his successful outcome depends on that triad. And I do believe we have approached um, uh, pretty much an optimization of uh, geometric design uh, and certainly material performance when those designs are articulated. Well, Seth, Seth, thank you for that comment. Just, you know, one quick thought on that is uh, I agree with you on the biomaterial side of things. When we look at knee design, though, we have, you know, a triathlon as an example, single radius of curvature. We have persona <laughs> variable. We have journey two, which is kinematically matched or aligned. And that's sort of what I'm getting at. I, I agree that we've sort of reached a, a good plateau in terms of the longevity of these implants. And Dr. Howell would be curious to, to see if you felt that, and I happen to agree with you, I do put in my knees with some kinematic alignment, but if you have a, a thought on, on which of these philosophies matter, it sounds like you've gone with a medial pivot. M my thought process is, is there more than just medial pivot when it comes to matching that, you know, when I'm saying kinematic motion, I don't necessarily, I'm not getting into the alignment debate, more the question mm -hmm. of, a, a total knee that moves like our knee. And, and I agree that 
I happen to agree with Dr. Howell that you need to put it in in a certain condition, but agnostic of that approach, uh, looking at, uh, aside from alignment, do we need a knee that's more kinematically matched with our own knee in terms of the implant design itself? Because there are a wide variety of designs that exist out there now. Let me, let me share this. Um, you know, in terms of the insert, when, when I started doing the medial ball and socket, which has a flat lateral insert uh, and a socket medially, not constrained, but a socket, um, I had to cut the PCL. So after about a year of that, the company was kind enough to give me a new insert that allowed me to retain the PCL. However, they flattened down a little bit of the medial compartment. They were afraid that I would over constrain it, you see, and that was in 2018. And I put, I don't know, 1,200 or something of those in. And I've got 10 or 15 uh, patients that have a little bit of AP play medial because they didn't get contained by the posterior lip. And with the flat lateral side, it led to some issues. So in August of 21, coming up on three years this, this August, I switched over to a true ball and socket retaining the PCL. And so those patients I went back in that were having trouble, I popped out the insert and I stuck in the one with the ball and socket and reduced the symptoms. So I think that for the knee, we always want to have our fully extended flex. But for that knee to feel normal, in my view, not only should it fully extend and flex, but in extension, it should screw home. And when you flex the knee, it should internally rotate with the same degree that the normal knee does. Because when the knee flexes and the tibia internally rotates, it takes tension off the medial retinaculum. And when it doesn't internally rotate, it keeps it snug. And that's the patient comes in and says, you know, doc, I got a stiff knee. And you say, Mary, would you mind doing me a favor? Bend your knee for me. And they bend the knee all the way up. And then you say, bend your other knee. And they bend it exactly the same. And then you say, Mary, how can your knee be stiff? Well, it's stiff because it takes her more torque to get the knee fully flexed because she has to over overcome the increased tension in the retinaculum. So every time she gets up from a sitting position, she's in an airplane, she thinks of you because her knee is stiff and it cannot be gotten rid of. So we know from my, my old sports days, the lateral meniscus is not stabilizing. It is load bearing, but not stabilizing because it moves back and forth on the plateau. But the medial meniscus with the coronary ligament creates a socket. And so when, if you were to do a thought experiment, some, someone comes to your office, doc, I'd like a total knee. What would it be like? I said, well, let me do this. Let me go in and your good knee because you, know, you're, you're, you have another knee that's real good. I'm gonna go and scope it. I'm gonna cut your ACL out and I'm gonna do a partial medial meniscectomy. And then I want you to go back to the gym and see how you like your knee. And if you like it, I'll put a total knee in. I mean, that's the thought experiment. So why don't we put in a medial socket that stabilize it, flatten the lateral side to allow the tibia to move and give them the chance for the knee to feel more normal, restore yeah. the native screw home and internal rotation that takes place in the native knee, which may, and we believe, that this has improved our forgotten joint score about six points. And the other thing we have to do is do something with the trochlea because the prosthetic trochlear groove at six degrees relative to a line that's drawn perpendicular to the distal joint line of the femoral component is too narrow and about 20% of mechanically aligned total knee replacements and about 80% of femoral, of kinematically aligned femoral component. Because when you put it in, the prosthetic trochlear groove in that, those percentages is medial to the rectus femoris line of force, which comes from the anterior inferior iliac spine to the center of the patella. And that's the Q angle. So it doesn't express itself as patella instability. It expresses itself as a reduced forgotten joint score. We just sent the paper in the Journal of Arthroplasty yesterday. And so you get 13 point higher score when you're not, when, you're, when your prosthetic trochlear groove is lateral to the, uh, to the quadriceps line of force. And, uh, and I think- Huh? Go ahead, but Seth. Take it easy that, um, do you routinely replace the patella or do you retain it? Uh, Robert Barrick, my, my dear friend, came out and has visited me three times. Uh, but the only <laughs> guy from the New Society that ever came out to see what kind of nonsense I was doing out in Sacramento. And the second <laughs> time Robert came out, he told me, you know, I don't think you have to replace the patella. And I will say this, that when I didn't do it in about 500 knees, I went back on quite a few and put the button in. And in kinematic alignment, in contrast to mechanical alignment, it tends to help. Now, I'll also say that when you look at the complications in Dossett's study that I just showed that was published last week or this week, a 13-year follow-up, you go to the New Zealand one, most of us patellofemoral complications that KA has. 
And a lot of times, and later in this, and we've seen this in our own now that we're going from the 10 to the 15 year, we have two people with a patella button popped off. So, and so, and some of those are related to excessive flexion of the femoral component relative to where you might want to put it. And that was primarily the result of the PSI guides that when you put them on, you had a tendency to jiggle them around to the locked in place. And when the fit wasn't ideal, you would flex it a little bit. And so for every, every, every five degrees you flex the component, you have to drop the size one, which reduces the surface area of the prosthetic trochea to capture patella, and then you can get yourself into some issues. So I think that with kinematic alignment, when you don't flex the femoral component, it helps you in those regards. But, um, but the idea of maybe, you know, widening the, the funneling effect of the prosthetic groove so that you incorporate the, uh, the uh, uh, rectus femoris line of force in every patient might theoretically help you improve your forgotten joint score and maybe your patella complications. Okay. Right. We have a question from the audience, the last question of this panel. Uh, my question is to the panel. We have the idea that no significant difference in arthroplastic survivability and normal and mechanical. So what about the early recovery and what about the avoidance of medical complication by robo? Does it have significant evidence that so, we can put in the court of law? So the, the question is, does using robotics reduce the incidence of medical complications, uh, uh, Stephen, uh, Ravi, and uh, Dave, I see David is also online. So maybe David, you, you can also chip in with your, uh, with your comments uh, and say, of course, uh, does using uh, a robot reduce the incidence of soft tissue complications, medical complications, pulmonary embolism, and so on? So, Steve, Steve let me start with you. Do you well, have we, a, do you, do you, since you since 2020, like <laughs> since July of 2020, when COVID hit, uh, we have done all of our total knee replacements same day discharge every single one. Now, there might have been 15 over the last two years. It was coming up on three years now, 20 or something that spent the night because of something, you know, I knocked the perineal nerve out for a day with an injection or something, but almost all go home. So how can we improve on that, at least for length of stay? I believe that yeah. sticking so, the pin. So what you think is you, you, you are you are the robot, Steve. Yeah. Right, no. you got your point. So Ravi, your take on it. You've asked a very good question, if I interpret it correctly. Does the employee of a robot uh, in a total knee replacement reduce the incidence of uh, post-operative complication? Was that your question? No, medical complications, readmission rates, pulmonary embolism, cardiac events, confusion. Yeah. Advocates of robotics uh, allude to the fact that because they're not uh, breaching the medullary canals, the incidence of pulmonary complications, the shower, the uh, transesophageal um, ultrasound seems to demonstrate a lower load fat load in the, in, into the right heart. Is that something you agree with? Do you have an opinion on that? Well, with our kinematic alignment technique, we don't go up the IM canal. We only go in about 10 centimeters in the diaphysis and then metaphysis to set our femoral components. So but we have very few of those complications. So I'm not sure putting two large pins in the femur and the tibia, uh, which has a risk of so, fracture. So you, you make a differentiation between 10 centimeters and 30 centimeters. Would that, would that be different? You're still reaching the canal, right? Yeah, but we're not going up the diaphysis where the fat is. You know, we're staying in the metaphyseal portion of the bone. So we're, we're not we're not going up the up the canal like you know when we used to cement the femur. We always worried about hypotension when you uh, you know when you pressurize the femoral canal with cement. You thought, oh my goodness, let the anesthesiologist know, make sure they were fluid loaded and so <laughs> forth. Uh, you, you know, we're we're not driving a rod up the diaphysis where the fat emboli uh, generally get uh, get generated from. So maybe that's a factor. So I, I can I, summarize I, today, so we have no obvious evidence that robotics is reducing this type of rate of complication. And as mentioned before, you can also 
reduce the rate of complication by the therapeutic management of your patient. Whether you use the robot or not, there's do and don'ts around knee arthroplasties that are also helping you to reduce your rate of complication. It's not all about the robots. I would, I would like to offer just one comment, if I may. Um, so I'm a technology advocate. I've been doing navigation since 2000 and robotics since 2014. There's a recent excellent article in the Journal of Arthroplasty, which is a well-respected American journal in December 2022. It was uh, looking at the database from Premier Healthcare, which was 850,000 patients from 2015 to 2020. They noted an increase in robotic assisted knee replacement and computer navigation over that period. But compared to manual instrumentation, there was a lower rate of DVT, lower rate of PE, lower rate of MI, lower opioid use, higher rate of um, same day discharge, lower blood loss, less hemarthrosis, and a lower 90 day readmission than manual instrumentation. So there is a large study that supports reduced complications uh, using robotics and navigation technology. Um, in terms of the concern about fractures related to pins, um, that's a very rare complication and it can be minimized using smaller diameter pins, metaphyseal location of your pins. And in our institution, it's 0.01%, which is extraordinarily rare. And we've seen zero in the past five years since we've changed our pin type and location. So I think there is good evidence out there that using robotics or navigation can reduce your medical complications. Yeah. Who are the authors of the, the uh, robotics paper in the JOA that you just quoted? The lead author, his last name was Wang, but I don't have the paper in front of me, but I could certainly pull it up for you. Well, I just was curious to know who who were the authors. Well, I would agree, David. I think that, you know, that really it is a, it is a variety of things. And uh, Sebastian, same thing, you know, pre-op, you get them prepared. But, you know, when you have a relatively short surgery, low anesthetic, you get nice block in there, um, you know, uh, you spare the soft tissues injury, the patients can get up and move. Uh, you know, this it's, it's, I tell you, it, it has blown my mind the last three years. If you told me in, in June of 2020 that we could have set all these people home on the day of surgery, I would have said, you're out of your mind. And uh, it's just what's happened. And uh, the admission rate, you, know, you see it. Some people get a little arrhythmia when they go home and that kind of thing, but it's relatively infrequent, certainly no more than the readmission rate when the patient stays a night or two in the hospital uh, in the days of old. So it's, and our, our narcotic use, we tell the patients that 85% of our patients use 20 pain pills or less. And that we, we say that to them, listen, go ahead and take a couple. If you need them, you take them, take them. You won't need them the first day because our block works. Second day, take them during the day. After that, maybe just at night, get by with a lever. And that's what they take. So the narcotic use is way down and uh, people are up and about. And then that's really what the older person wants. I'm now an older person. I'm 69. I don't want to be sitting around. I'm going to be up walking and getting back to things and not having to, we don't use formal physical therapy on anybody, just like anterior hip people do. They get to do the rehab on their own. And uh, it's really changed the paradigm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for these uh, last uh, comments. We're going to move to the next part of the session. Thank you very much to both of you for uh, attending and being uh, here still so late. Uh, you are more than welcome to stay, but we will understand as well uh, if, you, if you leave us uh, a big round of applause for our Thank you for having us. Thank you indeed. <laughs> I'm going to leave you because it's midnight where I live. <laughs> It's my bedtime. <laughs> See you, you guys. So very nice. Bye. Very nice. Very nice. Very nice. And uh, Steve, thank you very much. I appreciate you. We're going to move on now for the past, the last period. We're not talking about cars, okay? Come on, guys. We're going to talk about surgery again, which is great. And uh, we're going to have uh, next Dr. Dr. Ravi to speak about this uh, uh, outpatient uh, surgery. Uh, how are we going to do the long run?
the same format. Uh, you have question for the end of the session. And uh, we will try to, to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the session. Uh, Good evening, everybody. Um, I would uh, like to first thank Dr. Bagaria and Dr. Rajagopal for uh, inviting me to be a part of this conference. I'm very excited to be able to speak to all of you and look forward to our discussion and engagement um, after this talk. Um, I'm here to talk about outpatient joint replacement, uh, which has obviously become much more common in the United States, but is something that I think is gonna be continuing to be a worldwide trend. And I'd like to share my experiences and uh, hopefully have the chance to discuss um, this uh, with everybody in the discussion session here. So, in general, the evolution of outpatient joint replacements at my institution, uh, the first part of it at least mimics um, uh, the evolution of joint replacement in general uh, at many places. Uh, in the 1980s, we had patients coming to the hospital before surgery, pre-op admission, one or two weeks in the hospital. As we evolved, this got better, um, and we uh, started to uh, be able to get people home sooner and sooner. When I joined my practice in 2011, one of my main tasks was to start a post-op day one discharge program. Uh, we had many patients staying two or three nights, and we said, "Hey, for the the patients that are that are able to do so, we should like we sure would like to get them home the next day." And we were able to do that. And starting in 2017, so about six years ago now, um, we were able to really start planning an outpatient program. And for the past five years have been uh, really running through it um, at, at a pretty regular pace and it continues to grow. Um, and yes, I do this not necessarily in an outside ambulatory surgery center, but in my own hospital. So this is something that can be done in a traditional standalone hospital uh, with the right planning and protocols. But before we get to that, the big question is why? Why do we want to do outpatient joint replacement? So uh, a big part of it is for our patients and, provi our, and our providers. Um, as surgery, the, the, the practice of surgery, especially within joint replacement has advanced, we have better outcomes. We're able to get people done in a less invasive fashion. Um, and this is safe to do. And, and I will tell you that patients really appreciate the ability to go home the same day, again, for the right patient, both in terms of their mentality and mindset, as well as their medical and, and, and social comorbidities. So um, I think we have a good reason why we want to do it. In general, sending people home and not keeping them in the hospital is a good concept. We know that Patients are more comfortable and happier at home, which helps their recovery. We also know that there's a decreased risk for hospital acquired infections and pneumonias and things of such nature. Um, at the end of the day, whether you agree with this or not, I think that most of us would agree that outpatient joint replacement is here uh, and it's growing. Um, and I would also say that it's safe and good for patient care. If this wasn't safe, we shouldn't entertain it no matter what the, the additional benefits may be to patients or providers. But there's numerous studies that have demonstrated its safety. And at the end of the day, if we have something that's safe, that is growing, it's really important for surgeons and systems to engage in, in, in this sort of a trend uh, to be able to preserve volume and value. Um, within the United States, we have bundled payments and being able to send people home the same day helps us do better with those bundles. And again, if this wasn't safe, we wouldn't do that. You always have to put the patient first. So there's lots of data uh, and many studies at this point. I don't think it's any any longer controversial to say that same day joint replacement surgery when done properly uh, is safe uh, for the patient. So that is something that's at the core and crux. And I would tell you and encourage you that as you start to initiate your program to very closely follow the outcomes of your outpatients uh, and learn from um, any uh, setbacks that you may that you may go through. But in general, how do we manage outcomes in outpatient joint replacement? How do we make sure that we're doing this in a way that's that's fast but not furious, as per the uh, title of this section? Um, the number one most important factor in, in being able to have a successful outpatient joint replacement program is patient selection. Number two, that's not a typo, patient selection. It's that important. Um, this is really the key to having a successful joint replacement program. <clears throat> Picking the right patients allows us to be successful, and that involves both social and medical factors. 
the third part is the team approach. And, and you know, I, I kind of uh, make light of patient selection. It's, it's very important. But collaborating with your team members, anesthesia, physical therapy, um, the hospital staff is critically important. And putting that all together um, is critical for success here. We don't operate in an island or, a, or in a vacuum. We need to engage with our team members even more so when we're doing outpatient joint replacement. I think surgeon confidence and volume, making sure that you've done this before and are confident that you can do a minimally invasive rapid surgery are important. And then finally, enabling technology. I think that many of the technologies that we have allow us to do these operations in a more reproducible, efficient manner, and that's really important. And again, just at the end, I'll stick it in there. Patient selection gets back on the list because it is so critically important. So how do we go about patient select selection? We'll get to the medical stuff shortly, but the short answer is that you need motivated patients with appropriate support. You need patients that want to go home. And as you get more comfortable, you'll feel comfortable recommending that and telling them that they should go home when they're appropriate. But at, at, at base, if you have a patient that absolutely has no interest in doing it, you try to tell them the benefits of it, but they just don't want to, that's not gonna go well. So you need motivated patients and they also have to be appropriately supported. They need to be able to go home and have good support at home when they when they get to the house. And, and that gets to this need for a reliable coach. And uh, you know, certainly uh, in the Indian market, uh, the, the tradition has been to keep people in the hospital uh, a bit longer. And, and there's different challenges in India than those that we face in the United States. Transportation, lack of elevators, needing, needing to go up lots and lots of, of stairs. And I would just say that whether you're doing the same day discharge or the next day discharge um, for some of your patients um, uh, at home, these, these, these lessons still apply. So um, having a reliable coach is really, really important. And getting that coach educated about what to expect after surgery, that's really critically important. Medical optimization is obviously important here. You don't want to be you're doing your sickest, oldest patients as outpatients. Age is relative, and we'll talk about our evolution here shortly. In general, when you start, avoid people that have complex medical issues. As you get more and more comfortable, you'll understand what the, the, the barriers are, things like diabetes. When you start, you may want to avoid all diabetics. As you become more uh, 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 comfortable with the approach, you might start doing type 2 diabetics. We're at the point now where if somebody's a well-controlled, insulin-dependent diabetic, we, we will still do them as an outpatient if they're otherwise appropriate. But initially, you want to avoid major medical issues, and that's kind of common sense. I think that when you start, if you really want to hone in on this, focusing on patients that are less than 65 years old and have a BMI less than 35 is really a good initial screen. As you get more and more comfortable, um, you'll start to see how you can move that within your own practice. Um, the oldest outpatient I've done to date uh, was 79. Um, today, I did two, 70, uh, two people in their 70s, uh, a 77 year old and a 75 year old. And if you pick the right folks, um, you know their, their physiological age is actually much more important than their chronological age. But in, when you start out, I think that age and BMI are good initial screening factors. Combine these with medical comorbidities to really optimize your screening. Um, again, as I've emphasized, motivated patients, reliable coach, medically optimal. The team approach here is really, really critical. You need to coordinate with all relevant stakeholders. Anesthesia probably being the single most important. What kind of anesthetic are they gonna be delivered? You can do this with a general or with a spinal, but it's critical that it be a short acting anesthetic that wears off quickly so that the patient can get back um, to uh, getting to PT very quickly, minimal narcotics um, in order to avoid nausea and vomiting after surgery and to avoid disorientation. So minimal, uh, minimal narcotics, you can do it with a general or a spinal. We've done it both ways at our institution. Nursing is important. Part of this uh, process is making sure that the patient knows every step along the way that they are an outpatient. So the, the nurses, the therapists, everybody that, in, that interacts with them is encouraging them and building on that confidence saying, Yes, you are going to be able to go home today. That's critically important. Physical therapy, I think, is important. Um, if you're using a home health agency, that's important as well. And your hospital administration, it's important that they be behind, be behind this because it does take special resource and allocation in order to make this happen. This is very complicated, obviously, not complicated, but, but very deep. You can have a full 40 minute talk on this. And, and we've done that on ViewMedi. If you look it up, um, myself and, and Dr. Ritesh Shah and Dr. Nirav Shah um, have a few talks on ViewMedi that go into this part of things in detail. Surgeon confidence is important. You need a comfortable reproducible approach. Obviously you need to be, have, have, have done, you know, many of these to feel comfortable enough that you know you can pick the right patient for this. You need an experienced team in the operating room and you should start out with your most straightforward cases and using reliable implants that you're used to using. I think that being able to do the operation in an hour or less is a good benchmark. Um, if you're able to get to that level, um, you're probably safe to start moving forward with outpatients. 
I think enabling technologies help for me specifically, patient-specific instrumentation, robotics and advanced wound care have been helpful to advance this. Um, on the wound care side, I know it's not something we talk about a lot, but when I'm sending somebody home the same day, I certainly want their wound to be under good control. I don't want them calling me later that evening saying they're having uh, drainage. They're also going home. I want something exclusive and, and antimicrobial and something that's easy to manage and something that's compressive. So I use negative pressure. I specifically use a, a device called the Pico, uh, along with an Acticoat, which is a silver impregnated dressing, which has been excellent for me, not really having any calls about drainage, um, both on my hips and my knees. And I would tell you that trying to find a way to compress a hip incision, it's challenging. So negative pressure can go a long way there. I use this on all of my outpatients, and we don't really get phone calls about wound or drainage or issues. This dressing stays on for about six days, and then we take it off. Again, happy to talk about that further. You can do a whole talk on that as well. On the day of surgery, we're doing minimally invasive surgery, um, light anesthesia, um, rapid recovery, and immediate physical therapy. Many of these patients, we you know operate on them starting at about 7 or 7.30, and they're home by 1 or 2 in the afternoon, and we do keep in close contact with them on the phone. So far at my institution, we're at about, a, about 750 cases that I've done on an outpatient basis. We're almost 100%. I about... Two months ago, I had somebody that had to be admitted for urinary retention. So now I can claim 99.9% .9 success in being able to go home the same day when you're planned to do so. None of these patients have been readmitted to the hospital after discharge for any complication or issue. Uh, again, that probably goes more to us selecting the best of the best to be able to go undergo this. And about 50% of our patients use no opioids whatsoever. The other 50% are off by the end of the first week. And patients are really happy. When we track our satisfaction scores, they're greatly appreciative of being able to spend the first night uh, at home. And all of our employed patients have been back to work within three weeks. There's a big market for this in the outpatient space. We know that in the U.S. this demand is growing. I won't spend too many times on these graphs because I'm getting to the end of my time here. But we fully anticipate uh, that uh, there's going to be a, a dramatic shift towards outpatient joints. Is it going to be 51% in three years? I don't know if it'll be that level, but things are, are certainly trending forward. I do about 30 to 40% of my cases at outpatients now. Uh, so in general, teamwork, working with your cohorts in anesthesia, picking the right patients, and everybody's got to be on the same page. The patient, the care, the caretaker, the anesthesiologist, the hospital, we all have to be on the same page together. Use enabling technology. I use patient-specific instrumentation on a lot of my knees and robotics as well. You'll see a video of that in a moment, um, and we can do well with this. So here's a brief video. Uh, I know I'm slightly over time. This video is about 45 seconds, I believe, so hopefully we can show this and then move on. Thank you for your time. I feel, feel free to reach out to me individually with any further questions or concerns. I'm always happy to talk about this. So any question for this uh, talk? Yes. How many hours? How many hours before the Yeah, um, thanks. And thank you for doing the questions earlier. I, I pre-recorded that video, so I certainly am not in the same uh, energetic mood as I was earlier this week. So thank you for doing it uh, earlier. Uh, in general, uh, you know, our OR days uh, start, uh, the official start time is 7.30, usually making incision by 8. We routinely have that first outpatient out the door uh, by noon or 1 o'clock, so four or five hours. Um, there are ambulatory surgery centers so that's done even more quickly, but for us routinely um, four to five hours um, from the start of the, from their incision to out the door uh, is, is pretty routine for us. Yeah. And any any situation where you have to keep the patient instead of discharging the patients? So I guess so, uh, you try criteria and, and can you can we explicit that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. So all of the patients are seen by physical therapy in the in the recovery area. So they have to pass physical therapy. They have to ambulate. They have to go up and down stairs, and they have to pass. There's a general physical therapy screening that they have to do before they go home. Um, as I said, we've been very successful with this. Um, out of my approximately 750 that I've done in the past few years on an outpatient basis, um, we've only had one that had to stay, and that patient was um, admitted because they had urinary retention. 
Um, and that is something to look out for. It's common in, in you know, older males, obviously, with, with prostate issues. Uh, but in general, for us, as long as their vital signs are stable, their pain is well controlled, and they've passed physical therapy, um, and, they've, and they've been able to urinate, um, we've, we've, we allow them to go home. So we've not really had any major issues. The patients are monitored, but we've not had anybody that's gone into, you know, uh, an arrhythmia or had anybody that's had any, you know, desaturations or any major medical issues. Some people end up staying longer than the four hours. I would say on average, it's four or five hours for us. But if somebody's a little slow to recover from the anesthetic or whatever it might be, um, that can, that can factor in. And initially, uh, you know, it took time for the anesthesia team to build trust with us, you know, for, 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 to be, to be confident that we were going to be done in less than an hour. So sometimes it took the block a little bit w- longer to wear off, but now we use a short acting cl- uh, chloroprocaine spinal that usually wears off about an hour and a half after they administer it. Um, and that allows people to really get up and move around pretty quickly. So hopefully that answers the question. If not, please feel free to, to follow up. Thank you so much, Ravi. I think uh, our delegates were, was very uh, happy with the, the answer. We have one more question for you, and after we're gonna we're gonna let you go. Hi, Doctor Ravi. Great talk. Uh, I just was wondering how are you uh, optimizing energies here uh, in terms of uh, blocks, infiltrations, and medication. Thank you. Um, I was able to hear that question. Question. So um, it's an excellent question. Um, and again, that talk was 10 minutes. You could do an hour long talk just on this topic. In general, there's a couple of brief answers. One, it's got to be a multimodal approach you, working with anesthesia and physical therapy. I'll just give you a quick example. When we first started doing these, we did these with a short acting general because the anesthesiologists were a little bit nervous uh, and the therapists were nervous. They said, oh, the block's not going to wear off by then. So we actually did them with a general initially. Um, and, and as we built trust, as I said, on the anesthesia side, we do a short acting spinal with no peripheral block. So for example, with our hips, um, you know, often they would do a fascia iliaca block. We found that even though the literature and anesthesia reports that there's very little motor deficiency with that, we found some people did have a motor de- deficiency and it was delaying our discharging and it didn't limit us from leaving anybody leaving. I do also use a periarticular injection. Um, I started out using liposomal bupivacaine. Uh, the trade version of that was Exparel. Um, I found that I didn't think that that was super necessary. So now we use our own cocktail of lidocaine, marcaine, uh, bupivacaine, and morphine that we inject into the periarticular space on both hips and knees. Um, And then finally, in terms of our oral medications, we use a multimodal approach. So everybody gets Celebrex and Gabapentin on the non-opioid side, which help to potentiate each other. Um, We make sure nausea is well controlled, which sometimes, um, you know, can be another, it's not a pain symptom, but adds into it. Uh, And then we usually give them a very light um, uh, uh, narcotic if needed, and that's tramadol. Um, and as I said, about half the patients don't use anything after they leave the ha- hospital. The other half are off after a week. So it's multimodal. The pain medicines that they go home with include an anti-inflammatory and a nerve blocking agent. Um, and uh, I, I, we use a periarticular block in addition to short regional anesthesia. So happy to follow up um, you know, specifically on that with anybody, but I'll leave it short for now so you guys can get back to the rest of it. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your talk and your comments and announcement. We will close. Thank we you. We let you go. <laughs> You're discharged. Thank you so much. Thank you. My family will be happy. Thank you. Good night. So we're gonna we're gonna move on to the, the next feature and talk about going back to the implants and talking about bio shades retaining knees. David, can you hear us? By the way, I, I love robots as well. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to do this talk live because the timing is a little bit more favorable in Hawaii um, than it is over there. So is are you able to um, see my screen okay? It looks good over there. Okay, so I, uh, I'm going to give you some pearls about bicruciate retaining knees, and I am a consultant for Smith Nephew Orthograde and also VR, but I also, this is a, a passion project. I started working on this knee design in 2004 because I'm 55 and I have knee arthritis and I still have my ACL. And I also believe that bicruciate knees can be successful. 
The Townley knee showed 89% survivorship at 23 years. This is a first generation knee implant with not crosslink poly with cobalt. Mm -hmm. So I think we can do a good job. So if you understand your indications and you have a good implant and use intelligent technology, you can have success. The indications are what you'd expect. Someone who has medial compartment arthritis or lateral compartment arthritis combined with patellofemoral disease, more than what you would consider to do with a unit compartmental replacement. And this is a nicely executed bicruciate sparing knee. And this is the patient at 12 weeks post-op. So you can get incredible range of motion, great stability, and more importantly, you preserve proprioception. So when I look at indications, I'm looking at four things. How much deformity do they have? As indicated earlier, if someone has more than 10 degrees of a varus deformity, they're likely to have an insufficient ACL. So of course they have to have a good ACL. A flexion contracture tends to be a problem, especially if you have to start moving your joint line. And I want patients for BMI under 35 because of the stress on the tibial plate and they should have good bone stock. So a typical patient, this patient has an active pickleball player. She has medial compartment arthritis, pretty severe patellofemoral disease. This is her bicruciate retaining knee. And this is her six weeks post-op. And Come on. larger, this patient is a BMI of 30. In this patient, we decided to do a bicruciate sparing knee. And again, this is his post-operative x-rays. This is him immediately post-operatively. And this is him at six weeks post-op. So the question is, do you need an MRI before to assess the integrity of the ACL? And in patients who have a big varus deformity and the ACL is worn, they'll have uh, this posterior pattern of wear. If the knee is sitting where it belongs, the femur over the tibia, then they typically do have a good ACL and I rely on my clinical exam. So red light contraindications, be wary of large deformities, especially significant lateral tibial subluxation. A large flexion contracture is definitely a no-go. I'm cautious with patients with BMI over 35 and bone stock has to be good, particularly on the tibia side. I would not use this as a bailout or a conversion from a uni. So this patient had an ACL reconstruction and I really wanted to do a bicruciate sparing knee, but this is a non-anatomic ACL reconstruction. The knee was unstable in rotation. So we did a bicruciate substituting total knee replacement and she's done very well. So implant design is important. We've had some spectacular failures with bicruciate sparing knees in the past. And the Journey 2XR is a total knee resurfacing. And I, I love what Professor Howell was saying about restoring pre arthritic anatomy. This is an anatomic prosthesis. It has a larger radius of curvature medially and a smaller radius of curvature laterally. It's based on MRI and CT data of 10,000 knees. The tibia was designed, it's made of titanium, so it transmits stresses beautifully to the bone. And it has this keel, which gives it stability like an I-beam and strength and good bite and fixation in the tibia. The tibia surface will drive the motion somewhat. It's concave medially and convex laterally like a normal knee. You can see that in the implant design. So this combined gives you this oblique joint line, which is physiologic and anatomic and keeps the femur located directly over the tibia. And it rotates as you go in and out of flexion. You have this nice rotation that normalizes ligament tension and enables deep flexion. Now you have to put this implant in precisely and the implant is less constrained than a typical total knee. It's not a ball and socket type knee. It's really ligament driven motion. So if you move the joint line proximally or distally, you have abnormal tensions on the ACL and PCL, and you'll have a very stiff knee. And you wanna balance it medially like a medial uni. So two millimeter gaps in flexion and extension. And laterally balance it like a lateral uni where you have three millimeters in extension, opening up gradually to seven millimeters in deep flexion. So you are looking to create that oblique flexion gap Professor Hal had mentioned. And I need a computer to do this well. I started doing this without a computer in 2014, but I, I found it challenging to get consistent results. But now I use computer aided design that lets me prototype my decisions before I make any bony cuts. I use dynamic gap balancing with a tension gauge. So I know exactly my gap tension throughout. 
And I execute my plan precisely with robotic assisted bone milling with a handheld CNC machine. So a typical case, this patient is 47, he's 6'4", and he's a basketball player, and he works on the dock on the uh, tugboats. His knee has primarily patellofemoral disease, but he also has tricompartmental disease. So patellofemoral replacement alone wouldn't do it. His major issue is his trochlea dysplasia. I do not use a tourniquet. I do everybody through a subvastus approach. I think that helps with recovery. When I do my approach, think of it like a uni. You don't want to do a very large ligament release. You want to do minimal ligament releases, but you do want to remove the osteophytes so you have good sizing and planning for the robotics. The robotic systems, like the navigation system, use infrared trackers. We put our femoral tracker within the wound, the tibia tracker outside the wound. We define the center of the ankle by touching the medial and lateral malleoli, and a 60-40 split between the two is the center of the ankle. Center of the knee is at the center of the ACL footprint and the terminus of the trochlear groove. We can collect this with a point probe. And then we rotate the hip, and this will give us the center of the hip. So with all this data, we have the mechanical alignment of the limb, and I can dial it in. I tend to undercorrect the alignment slightly, but I want to stay within three degrees of neutral to optimize wear. We define the initial range of motion. We do this with a slight axial load. So all this takes very little time. We do image-free mapping. So this is tracing the outline of the femur. We have a database of CT scans. It brings up a mesh shape that's about the same size and shape of your knee. And now you're just coloring in and reproducing the cartilage surface of the knee that you're working with in real time. It takes about 40 seconds to register the knee. A total knee replacement for me takes 45 minutes with this technology. I'm faster with the robot than using manual instrumentation. The tibia is registered the same way, but I make some special points around the ACL footprint. And we're going to slightly internally rotate the tibia tray to match the ACL footprint rotation, just like a uni. And now we have initial implant placement. And in this case, I really want to reproduce the patient's prearthritic anatomy. I'm looking to match the joint line on the femur, match the posterior offset. I am not aggressively externally rotating the femoral component. I want to match the posterior condylar axis so I have that oblique flexion gap. The tibia, again, is matching the less affected joint line, and rotation is important to match the ACL footprint. Tibia base plate has to get good coverage and good positioning. And then we can stress our gaps, and we do this with a tensor gauge now. So we now have a gap assessment throughout the full range of motion of the knee and we can fine tune our implant to get the exact balance the way we want it. And we have information at zero and 90, but also throughout the full range of motion. So in this case, I was a little tighter laterally in extension for this valgus knee. And I made a decision, I'm gonna not do any releases. I'm going to do my knee and see what we have. We're removing the bone here with the CNC machine. And you can see we're not aggressively externally rotating that femoral component. We have very precise bone preparation. We can remove the bone for the tibia component with this milling technique. And you can see here that we're using this CNC machine to mill out the space for the keel. We have plenty of exposure. You can get to the back of the knee very easily and you can see an actual implant and there's plenty of room for the ACL and PCL. We can then import our trials and do an assessment of our gaps. And in this case, the IT band was giving us a little bit of tightness. So we did a pie crusting technique and we improved our alignment and our extension. This is the case information. So we have an integrated database with our cases and our outcomes. Intraoperatively, full range of motion quite easily. You can see this is a bone conserving prosthesis, really a total knee resurfacing. The femur is sitting where it belongs right over the tibia. We've maintained our oblique joint line. This is him going home the same day. For me, 75% of my patients go home the same day for primary knee replacement surgery. This is him at four weeks post-op. And these patients recover very much like a uni and require very little in the way of formal physical therapy. So this is one of the reasons we love this implant. So this is a challenging patient. This patient is surfing very high level and he wants to continue surfing and he's failed all our conservative management. Do I have a surgery that I can do for him that will let him perform at the high level that he's expecting? This is his plan. And again, we're restoring prearthritic anatomy. In an area where he has cartilage loss, we are putting extra implant back. We're matching his cartilage surface in the area where there's normal architecture. And again, matching the joint line. This is his surgical x-ray. 
This is him the same day going home with 135 degrees of flexion. He's back surfing. So he has great flexion, so he can pop up. He has great stability, so he can surf, and great proprioception. I think if you have good indications, an excellent implant, and intelligent technology, you'll have great success with bicruciate sparing knee replacement. It's my favorite procedure and draws a lot of patients to my practice. This is part of a family of implants, and there's a bicruciate substituting knee, a CR knee, which retains the PCL, and the XR, which retains the ACL and PCL. I would say I'd rather have a perfectly done bicruciate substituting knee than an XR where I was concerned about the quality of the ACL. So I'm critical about the ACL until the very last moment. It's easy with the robot to change implants. Our patients have high expectations. We have amazing implants out there that have a very high tolerance. So we have to make sure we use technology to do it and improve our accuracy and precision every time. Thank you very much for your attention. I really appreciate the opportunity to participate in this conference. Thank you, David. Uh, excellent presentation, and uh, thank you for joining us live. Uh, there are some questions uh, that uh, we have in the audience. So. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, I have two questions. First is how preoperatively you determine uh, for a particular patient whether the ACL is functional or not. And the second question is. In post-operative follow, whether that retained ACL gets torn, and how do you address that with the implant in C2? So um, I didn't quite get the second question, but I'll answer the first question first. So the, the first question is, how do I assess for ACL integrity preoperatively? Well, uh, one is history, you know, clinical instability. If they have any complaints of clinical instability or a major knee injury, that's one issue. Number two is the physical exam. Uh, particularly, they need to have good rotational stability, so they have to have a negative pivot shift. And the x-ray, as I indicated before, an anteromedial or more anterior pattern of wear is, is suggested they have an intact ACL. But the last is intraoperatively. I mean, I, I don't promise patients I'm going to do a bicruciate sparing knee. I'm going to tell them I'm going to do the best totally I can. And often I cannot fully assess the ACL until I look at it in person in the operating room and I've removed all the surrounding osteophytes and done my femoral preparation. If I don't absolutely love their ACL at that moment, I'll convert either to a, a CR or a bicruciate substituting knee. And preoperative MRI is hard to interpret because all these ACLs are in patients who are in their 60s. Yeah, I do patients in their 40s as well, but if, you, if you're questioning, is this an ACL, is a good ACL, they all are going to have degenerative changes. So the MRI is not as helpful. So um, I think the final proof is in the pudding. As we've heard a couple of times today, it's in the operating room. I make my final call. And with the robot, I can just hit a button, change the implant, make some very small changes, and then we're off and running. Can you repeat the second question, please? The second question, David, was you put in a a bicruciate retaining implant and the ACL fails, ruptures, what's your go-to uh, option in that case? If you have a okay. second, say a post-traumatic ACL rupture in a bicruciate retaining implant, what would you do? So there are a few options of what to do. We've um, only rarely encountered this. Um, in, in our practice, we have a bicruciate retaining these study group. So we've talked about different options for this scenario. So we had one patient who was a skier who then ruptured the ACL skiing with their new knee. And they were able to do uh, physical therapy and rehabilitation and overcome their feeling of instability. So one thing we've learned in our study group is that I limit the posterior slope on these implants to five degrees. I think if you have increased posterior slope, the tibia wants to go forward and it puts strain on the ACL, which, which is sometimes, uh, you know, it's a, an older ACL. So they're more likely to cope with an ACL failure if you limit the slope on that tibia implant to five degrees. Uh, the, the second thing is there are other polyethylene implants you can put in that are upslope. So you can decrease the slope. So you could do a revision surgery um, where you put in an upslope poly where you decrease the tibia slope that would convert someone into a coper. And finally, you could do a revision of the tibia only and retain the femur because it's a CR femur. 
and uh, just do change it to a CR knee with a poly that has a, a deeper medial dish and a lateral posterior slope. So you still get that kinematic motion. You have a driven uh, rotation as you go into flexion. So those are the options, but uh, no one has tried, although it's theoretically possible to, no one's tried to do an ACL reconstruction through this implant. David, one last question for you on, from my side. Um, this is obviously a great alternative uh, to patients who are high demand and who have good ACL, PCL, okay, fabulous uh, progress. What's your take on doing a bi-uni? I'm mean, putting a, a needle in the lateral uni. It does the same function. Um, would it be easier to do those? Do, do, do we have any uh, data comparing a bi-uni outcomes to a bi cruciate uni outcome? It's an excellent question. So I've I've gone down this pathway uh, in my own practice. I have done the bi uni uh, on a patient before this implant was available. It was a patient who was a police officer. They needed the uh, proprioception of their ACL for their function. So I did a medial and lateral uni, and they were able to get back to work. I, I think it's it's easy to do with a robot. Um, I don't have any studies on the medial and lateral uni. There is a good study that looked at um, survivorship um, of patients who had a medial uni, and then they had progressive patellofemoral wear. And then what I do in my practice for those patients, I just go use the robot and add a patellofemoral replacement to the medial uni and leave the lateral compartment alone since it's asymptomatic. So I think, and that was a European study and they have excellent outcomes, uh, you know, faster rehabilitation, lower rate of complications and doing a full revision. So I think combining, the more common pattern in my practice is medial and patellofemoral arthritis combined. So a medial, uh, I, and before the bicruciate knee was available, I would use the robot to do a medial uni and a PFJ. So I think that's a great option. Um, uh, but again, I think the uh, the results I've had with the bicruciate retaining knee uh, is, is reproducible. So in, in patients in my practice, I offer them either a uni, medial or lateral, or a bicruciate retaining knee but I don't offer them the medial and lateral uni as an option. Thank you, David. Uh, one question. Uh, great talk, David. Uh, Krishna here. Uh, I have one question for you. Uh, do you think it's critical to do an unrestricted kinematic alignment with the uh, bicruciate retaining? If so, uh, would you do a LDFA, MPTA slope measurement and then uh, replicate it, or you would? Uh, alter it because I expect if we alter the slope or the uh, distal femoral proximal tibial morphology, the isometric points for the cruciate may change. So you're asking a very uh, a question that's a, a complicated question that shows a lot of insight, and um, it's interesting when I'm listening to Professor Hal talk. So when you're talking about doing unrestricted kinematic alignment, you are forced to put. An, un, a non-anatomic implant into weirder positions to reproduce pre-arthritic anatomy. If you have an anatomically designed implant like the Journey implant, you don't have to accommodate such wide variations in positioning of the implant because the implant itself, if it's put in neutral alignment, will give you an oblique joint line automatically. So what I use when I'm doing the surgery is with the robot, we have three pieces of information. <clears throat> we have the three-dimensional shape of the, of the femur and the tibia. We have the mechanical alignment of the extremity. And we have the measured resections based on those uh, numbers. And then the third piece is we have the strain gauge. It gives us the MCL and LCL strain throughout the full range of motion. Okay. So when I'm doing a knee that has good basic anatomy and good range of motion, I'm gonna to try to reproduce their shape of their knee, match their overall alignment and focus on balancing their gaps perfectly. If I have someone who has a highly deformed knee, like they have a 20 degree varus deformity and a 10 degree flexion contracture, I have to use mechanical alignment as my guide. I cannot use their anatomy because their anatomy is so abnormal. So in those cases, I'm gonna be shifting and prioritizing different things than with an XR or a uni, where I'm trying to really reproduce anatomy and match function. But talking about unrestricted kinematic alignment, mechanical alignment, 
restricted kinematic alignment is a little bit different when you're using an anatomic prosthesis than when you're using a non-anatomic prosthesis. And I think that that's one distinction that Professor Howell didn't make is that if you're using any implant other than the Journey 2, they're all non-anatomic. So that's that you to reproduce the oblique joint line, you need to put the femur and valgus, the tibia and varus, and you have to internally rotate the femur a little bit. With the Journey knee, because the poly is thinner medially and thicker laterally, and the femur is larger medially and smaller laterally, the radius of condyles, you automatically get that obliquity of the joint line in flexion and extension without having to put the implant in weird positions. So it's kind of a, I'm sorry if that didn't quite answer your question, but it's a complex question. You get a, give a very subtle, uh, very telling answer. You said a lot without saying anything, <laughs> David. <laughs> Very well done. Handle that. Congratulations. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, you're welcome to stay on, but we'll move on to the next talk. Thank you, David. Thank you for including me. It's really is such an honor to be invited. I'm now to invite uh, my good friend and co moderator for this session, Seth Barrett. And he's going to talk to us about a bit of a philosophy of uh, the rule of low boss where we are going. It's all yours. Thank you so much, uh, Shock. We spoke a lot about robotics these past two days. And uh, I try to kind of summarize a little bit the fact. And I also try to have a look at what's going on with robotics. Um, it's not easy because it's always hard to predict the future, but we're gonna try to go through these different topics together. It's the last one. Yes. So I'm very biased for this talk because I'm one of the developer of uh, Rosa, but uh, I'm gonna try to not let it uh, uh, appear during this talk. And uh, like I said, I have a few <laughs> disclosures. You're more than welcome to uh, come to Abu Dhabi. It's a beautiful city. It's very near from, uh, from, from Mumbai and there's a lot of connection from India. So you see that, and you have seen that since a few years, it's the rise of the machine. For me, that was Terminator 3. I think it was 1988. And I was amazed by this movie because there were the first image, 3D image, animated images that I was seeing. And I was like, wow, this is a blast. I love that. I started then robotics in 2019, the 30th of March. So it's uh, three years now. And this, is, this was this weekend, actually. Interesting. And I want to say that it, it was an, like my first try with computer assisted surgery. And I kind of jumped back into computer assisted surgery after a few years of frustration. And I was like, okay, let's do that. Let's go back to computer assisted surgery because I started in 2001, 2002 with Jean-Noël Johnson, my mentor in uh, uh, Marseille. And we were using at that time the Star Wars vessels that we were implanting in the knee uh, to get the distal femoral axis and the proximal tibia. The sagittal cut was not that great, but we were super happy. And you see, it was made in France. We were very proud of that. And we were doing the first kind of computer assisted surgery uh, uh, at that time. The 14th of May, which is my birthday, I visited for the first time uh, Martin Roche uh, in uh, Florida who is one of the developer of the Maco before it has been bought by Stryker. And I saw for the first time a Maco plasty, a unicompartmental neatoplasty done with a Maco. And I was like, wow, this is a blast. I really loved it. And I came back to Marseille. I said, you know, I need to get that. I said, yeah, but it's very expensive, Seb. I mean, you can't get the for that. You know, it's America. It's different, you know. And their implants are not that good, you know. So, and then we, I never got the Maco. So... We kept on working. We worked on the smart tools. That was the time of PSI. That was the time of the accelerometer. So we went through all these phases of computer assisted surgery where we reduced the size of the machine. We had smarter tools, more, more, more affordable because there was no cost efficiency, no, no cost investment, no capital investment. And we worked a lot on that. During all these years, we published many papers and all these studies were based on comparing patient done with navigation, accelerometers, PSI, chasing for the neutral alignment and comparing the two system to chase neutral and mechanical alignment. And that was the basic purpose or the basic hypothesis that 
bringing back everybody under the same bell curve will increase the survivorship and make the results of total neoplasty better. But during all these years, the only thing that we were able to prove is that there was no difference between the computer assisted group, whether for total heap, for accelerometer, for PSI, for, uh, for anything, no difference. We even got a Miss Society Award to say that. Can you imagine? So I was like, wow, it's nice, but I was surprised in a way, you know, but a, a little bit frustrated. And we were also at that time able to show that the bringing back everybody on the same bell curve is not increasing the survivorship. And we work on this uh, famous uh, study or infamous study with Mark Pagnano and uh, Matt Abdel, my friend Matt Abdel published the 20 years result. So we know now that bringing back everybody under the same bell curve doesn't improve results. It's not enough. Doesn't mean that the alignment doesn't matter. It does matter a lot. The question is which one? And that's why after all these studies, if you read the, the conclusion of all these studies, they all saying that conventional instrumentation remains the gold standard because we can't prove the superiority of robotics, of computer assisted surgery, of PSI, of all these technologies. Doesn't mean that these technologies are not good. It means that we don't really know what to do with it or how to use it properly to show a benefit for our patient. Because at the end of the day, this is the thing. So in every meeting, you have the against robotic or against technology that are saying, you know what, it's the Scott parabola. You know the Scott parabola, it's uh, when there's a nice idea, it's a promising idea, and then everybody is using it progressively. It's becoming the standard of care, and then it's fading away. So we looked at that and we did a publication or we did a study to show that actually the Scott parabola doesn't apply for assistive technologies in knee arthroplasties. Instead, if you look at the numbers of publication, the numbers of use based on the registries, everything is growing up. And if you let me know, and if you say it's gonna disappear, I'm gonna say, yeah, maybe the big machine, the big arm are gonna change, but assistive technologies are here and they are in our life, they are everywhere. So it's here to stay, how we still don't know. And turns out that there's also new alignment options. And we published a lot about personalized alignment, the different concept. So you're gonna tell me, Seb, there's so many definitions, I'm completely lost. And we have had four speakers this morning. None of them had the same agreement on alignment. And we're talking about people that are doing knee surgeries. And the last speaker couldn't tell us exactly what is his own personalized alignment. You know what I mean? So. It's very confusing for everybody, but it's the revolution of how we see neoplasty. I'm gonna say it's an evolution. And the danger of that is to shift the curve. If you aim a target center of the room, okay? If you are a little bit on the left, it's okay. If you are a little bit on the right, it's okay. But if you aim for a target on the left side of the room, there's a high risk to get the first, the first wall. You know what I mean? So in neoplasty, this is the danger. If you shift your curve without any assistive technology saying, I want to do personalized alignment, sometimes it's a little bit too personalized and it's probably not what is good for the patient. So all these assistive technologies are tools, okay? They are just a tool. And remember, the goal is to reach a targeted angle, an amount of resection, or to optimize the uh, ligament balance. And it's all about the combination of accuracy and precision. It's, this is the goal of robots. It's not to make patient doing better. It's thinking that aiming for a target with precision and accuracy, which is the good target for the patient, and we'll come back on that, will help us to achieve better results. So this is what we can kind of come up after 20 years of using computer-assisted surgeries. So now what about the fact about robotics? So, the first fact is that, as we saw before, we are not equal surgeons. There's good surgeons, there's not as good surgeons, and there's very good surgeons. And this is coming from the registries. And we know now there's outliers, there's a lot of numbers, and we know that there's surgeons with five to 10 times higher rate of revision than the others. Something is wrong. I'm sorry, but something is wrong. So we are not always good. And that's why the idea is to do a better job 
for every patient every day with a good accuracy, a good repeatability. And Atul Gawande published that very well in this book, Better. Uh, and, and it's very interesting to see that it's all about surgical performance and we have to be good. We are athletes. We don't get as much money as the IPL league player, as we were talking this morning with Ashok, but we are still athletes doing 10 knees a day, 10 total knee arthroplasty a day. It's, it's tough, you know, and the last knee, you're not as good as the first one. And we are not all as Ashok or Bob. We don't have that in our hands where this, it's all connected because of what we call experience and extremely uh, developed experience. And it's not coming from nothing. They were not born with that. They, they, they develop this kind of skill by spending hours and hours and hours in the operative room. And I don't think that there's anything that can replace that. Never forget that. And robotic is just a nice tool that can help. That can help what? That can help to achieve a better target. Once again, it's just a tool that is more accurate than the other one. It may translate into better clinical results. I say may because you saw in the literature that there's very divergent publication. Most of the publication are made by the developers of the robot. And, uh, and, and for Mako, it's absolutely true. I'm sorry, but it's very, very true for, for Mako, for example. And for the others, it's coming as well. So we can't really push into literature. It may translate. I do agree that it's relatively easy to learn. Why? Because you have somebody doing the planning in the room, you press on the burr, and for some of the uh, system, it's relatively easy to learn. The robotic technique itself, it's not very complicated. But the problem is that the surgical technique and the surgical experience, it's not coming with the package of the robot. It's not something like you get a shoot, you drink something, you know, suddenly you become the super surgeon because you have a robot in your room. But there's another fact, which is that it can be efficient. It can be efficient to reduce the uh, ancillaries, to reduce the trays, and to uh, stream down the instrumentation, which is making the life of the whole entire team easier because they don't have to carry as many tools as before. And there's another fact, the fact number five, which is probably the most important of all this talk. The Wall Street is ready. Everybody is behind robotics because the, the robotic market is crazy. And it's crazy in every domain. And as healthcare is also a crazy domain in terms of business, robotics plus healthcare, there's a huge push. Plus, we know that it's all industry driven. And we know that we are all boys, maybe sometimes a little bit more than boys. And the only difference between a boy and a man is the price of the toys. And you see that <laughs> we all pick that up, you know, and, and, and you can choose depending on the color and the car that you like. It's very industry driven. Plus, there's, uh, you don't have to, I mean, don't forget that there's negatives, you know, it's, it's something that we have to consider as well. Because there's still, cumbersome things, rigid bodies, the screen, you have to operate like that. You don't even look at the, you told me that. I don't even look at the knee. I look at the screen, you know? You told me that yesterday. So, I mean, it's okay, but there's bulky, expensive machines and I do the same when I do robotics. The planning is still a problem. The cost, of course, and we're gonna come back on that. And there's also another fact that is very important. Never forget the Dunning-Kruger effect. Okay, it's the graph between confidence and competence. And the danger of the surgeon with a robot is that, and this is the worst surgeon ever, the overconfident surgeon without the competence. And you don't buy the competence buying a robot, okay? It can boost your confidence, but you don't buy the competence by buying a robot. So be very careful with that, okay? The goal when you have a robot is to be here, to be confident and super competent, maybe even better than the average when you are not a shock or Bob Booth. You know what I mean? So this is something that you have to think about. So remember that the real problem might be the surgeon, okay? And it's not because you give this guy a robot that is gonna do a great knee. So it's, it's not done by him, but you see this is a robotic prosthesis. Okay, done in a very famous hospital in London for a bomb. And the patient from Oman came and I did the, the other knee. Okay, 
and she's very happy with this one. She's not that happy with this one, but you see that the surgeon did a, a great placement of the implant, but he forgot to remove the osteophyte, which means that the tibial plateau is not sitting at the right place, which means that two years after surgery, there's already a regular sensor. So, and it's a robotic, this is a robotic surgery. You know what I mean? So don't forget to be a surgeon when you're using a robot. So where are we heading? So the super optimistic vision is of course, to be the, the cyber, a surgeon and the cyber league of total neotoplasty. You place your picture here. You don't have to do anything anymore. You can cut with the tip of your finger. There's no arm, there's nothing. But it's not that true. And I was a, a bit tired when I finished my talk. So I said, okay, I'm gonna ask chat GPT. It's very trendy to do that. What is the future of robotic? And it turns out that the future of robotic looks promising. So I said, okay, it's worth to continue this talk and to try to think how is it promising because chat GPT doesn't give you much actually. Just a few words, you can say that in a dinner, it's nice, but not with orthopedic surgeons. So I went a little bit harder. And one of my first thing is that hardware. Hardware is terrible. It's hardware from the 2005, 2006. And when we started in Marseille, you remember I told you it's the Star Wars things, it's still the same. Didn't change in 20 years. While our phones changed a lot. Why don't we have the iPhone, okay? A face recognition on my iPhone. Why can't we have that in the OR for our bones? That would be much faster, much easier, and probably much more accurate. The screen and connectivity, why can't we see through? I mean, our kids are playing VR all day long and we can't do that in the OR, why not? And it's coming, but it's still not there. You see, this is the latest baby. It's not even FDA approved, it's Think Medical. They came up with the idea of one of the latest out there, which is the latest robot where you just pin pin and there's no arm, nothing. Is that the trend for the hardware? I don't know, maybe, but it doesn't really matter actually because the real problem is not about the hardware. To me, the real, real, real problem of robotic is the software. Why? Because in total neotoplasty, we don't know where we're going. There's this famous quote from Saint-Exupéry, which is saying a goal without a plan is just a wish. In total neotoplasty, I wish I could have a goal to make my plan because today it's still complicated. I mean, we take everybody in the room. Nobody will die the same thing in the computer. And we still don't know what is the best thing. Plus we have a million combination. When you look at a screen on the computer, there's a million combination because there's so many numbers and how to do that. And you see, we did a study in, in, uh, in Europe about the users of Rosa. It's the most important amount of time spent in the OR. This is with Franco Benazzo, the actual president of the European Knee Society he came to visit me for Rosa. And we were talking, talking, and my staff, my staff said, Doc, we have to move on, you know? I mean, it's, you're talking on the screen, but we have to finish the surgery. And it was funny because yesterday I was in the OR and I saw this time as well. You see, there was the six hand planning. And it's funny because everybody, you see, it's nicer. So I was like, okay, I'm not the only one when I'm using the robot to play with the planning. So there's really something that we can do for that. But the problem is what is the ideal target? We don't know. Okay, we don't know yet. We have no idea of what is the ideal target for the tibial cut, the distal femoral cut. And guys, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. It's from, Albert Einstein, and he was smart. And the thing is that if we do the same thing that we did with navigation, PSI, accelerometer, I mean, we can't expect any difference. We won't be able to show anything. So to me, the idea is to go towards advanced surgery where heart meets science. It's the, the trend of the future world. It's, it's the museum in Singapore that my kids love. And to me, it's really the combination of both. The concept is to find the best equation between planning, implant, and effector. Effector is whatever it's gonna be, how whatever it's gonna look. We don't care if it's a big harm, small harm, pins, no pins, burr, no burr. We don't care about that. The real problem is to use technology, which had an incredibly fast evolution during the last 20 years, to empower our surgical excellence, which still takes 20 years to acquire. So this is why you have to be a good surgeon with a good tool to start an endless four-step process, understand the 3D modelization of what we're doing preoperatively, apply, collect, and adjust. 
This is how we're going to become from the surgeon before. I will save the world with my knife and the Superman in the OR. With the, there's only two techniques in surgery, the bad one done by the others and mine. We all know that very well. And it's a classic <laughs> quote to tomorrow where we are going to have data, where it's going to be data before, data during, data after, data all the time. It's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of time. I don't know if we will ever see that really, but I think that it's coming and we have to kind of take the, take the train and, and jump in this train because that's gonna be the only way to answer the simple equation. We saw outpatient, okay? Which means patient wanted to be better, faster and forever. That's what they want. Why the hospital wanted to be cheaper, okay? And we are in between stuck in between the patient pushing on one side, the hospital pushing on the other side. So we have to become smarter. Otherwise we won't do this job for a long time. And we have to preserve ourselves to be able to have an access for everybody. And how are we gonna get there? By applying the principle of value-based healthcare delivery, which is to understand that the value is coming from the healthcare's outcomes that matters for the patient, divided by the cost to, de to deliver these outcomes. And as surgeons, we are not good to do that. So the hospital are pushing us on one side, the industry is pushing us on the other side, and we like in between, not really able to do anything with that. So in conclusion, robotics and assistive technologies are here to stay. We are working on positive evolution in terms of hardware. There's still a lot to do. We don't know how it's gonna look, but it doesn't really matter. The most important to me is to work on what we're going to do with it and how we're going to apply these plannings, this understanding of the knee anatomy to do a better job and to finally be able to answer or, or, or improve the answer to the value-based healthcare equation to make these technologies affordable and cost efficient. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, you can join me here and then we, we can have questions for Seb if there are any. I'm sure there are lots of questions. Seb, you're stunned and <laughs> No, but I, I have to make a few comments here. I, I think. For me, the takeaway for this meeting about the dogs has been the very uh, unbiased, unfettered uh, contemplation and delivery uh, philosophy, if I think that's the right word, from each of the speakers uh, that we've had uh, this morning from um, Seth's perceptive, uh, cumulative experience of development to Bob's very, very erudite uh, presentation on why nobody in the world should ever use a robot, uh, to Stephen Howe's completely sort of impassioned uh, delivery of one of the many, many variations of kinematic alignment. There are now seven kinematic alignments, and he's now talking about the unrestricted unfettered to Ravi Bashal's uh, uh, inputs on daycare surgery, uh, David's by crochet. And I think the icing of the cake was what Seth put together. I think it's a very balanced overview of, of what we are, where we are, where we, we are headed. And I think a meeting of this sort is really, really good because it allows people to hear various perspectives and take home what really matters to them. And I think the balance of the, the, the morning session has been really very well. You can keep it forward by saying that we don't have the answers. We don't even have the questions at the moment. So we are sort of floating somewhere in between. There are various iterations of what are, are currently available. Each one has their own thoughts. And if we cannot, uh, if we cannot even agree on basic concepts like alignments and philosophies on that front. Uh, what are we trying to achieve? What's our target area? I think we have a long way. So fair comment is whatever we are doing today is, is really a, an evolution. I think we're all 
uh, in the infancy of this so-called technology explosion, and only time will tell, you know, which was or which will continue to be the right. But one thing which is uh, which is uh, which is I think defined is we still do not know that the robots work. They work well. They don't work at all. We will have them five years from now. So with that. Any comments from any of the audience? My God. No, I, I, I think you summarized very well. Um, as you all know, there are a lot of known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. As long as we acknowledge what are unknown unknowns to be able to use, uh, a pool with pool is already doing a pool. But I think, as you rightly said, that curve is the, is the curve. If you are competent and you know how to use your device, the sky is level. So I think uh, everyone needs to understand. Everyone needs to understand that uh, technology is here to say we it's all there in my pocket. The the thing that I'm carrying in my pocket is more powerful than 1958 supercomputer that was first designed in terms of memory, in terms of processing speed. And yet that supercomputer allowed a man to be put on moon. So I'm sure that a lot of hard work goes. In understanding them, how you use technology will define where you help. So, I think there are some, some things have only uh, two sides but no end, and some arguments will remain like that. So, choose the side, flip the coin, and give it another. Thank you. Well, I've become the last talk in this session, and it's uh, with my two. Dear friends, both Vavil and Dylan, and intrigued to hear both of them. Tips and trends in our classroom. So, in this space between question and answer, there are trends. So when you don't have answers to all the questions, we take a refuge in trends, and that's what we are going to do with our presentation. Folders, yes, sir. A shock set. I think, as far as I was concerned, the conference was done yesterday. So I didn't really know what we were going to do in this talk. So Vaibhav comes to me yesterday and first, said that. First. Let's decide what the top 10 trends are. And we'll just see what each one has to say. So how do you predict future? And I, in this session, I would like everyone to join in. It's a free open house inflection point with a final word from Dr. Raj Gopal. So when I was given and we were given, how do you predict future? I think the way to predict future is ask the smartest people you know. So I asked. The two smartest people I know, Dr. Raj Gopal and Dr. Nilayan Shah, since we are talking about me, they are mostly not well aligned on many philosophies. Approach, Patela, so many things, but they are not aligned. But they are aligned on greatest things, which are outcomes. Both of them are outcome driven. Both of them have excellent range of movement and they know about patient, uh, the patient reported outcome mission. And that's what's critical. They are aligned on the most important subject, but they are not aligned on methodology. So with the two smartest people, I decided to just act as a balancer. We are talking about alignment and balancing. So I balance with my view on my own. I'm a stupid guy from a different generation who believes that he's smart. So that's here. And this top 10 things that I think will impact the way we do it among three of us is number one, we spoke to daycare surgery and ASCs. What's your take and how many, and we can engage the audience as well. I think uh, surgically, we are probably ready for daycare surgery. But the awareness in the patient population and the insurance is not quite ready as yet. So we all have patients who are walking in a few hours of surgery, but they are not ready to go home because the relatives also don't want them home. They are happy 
for them at least to be in the hospital for a day or two. Uh, I have sent patients home on the same day, but that's a rare event. But most people go home the next day. Now, whether we should be really pushing for sending them home in Mumbai or India, where the dynamics of a day stay, the cost is not as huge as in USA, I think is a matter of debate. Great. So can I have a show of hand how many people believe that 25%, I'm not talking about 100%, 25% of people five years down the line will go home the same day. 25% five. So massive show. So I think 25% all our patients will go home the same day in five years. So that's a trend. So we had very elegant talk by uh, both Sethi Gaur and uh, Babu. And I, I personally feel that that's right. And what he said in the end is probably what is true. That probably what we should be looking at is not replacing something which is natural with something which is purely artificial. So we'll probably eliminate knee implants and knee surgeons in that particular traditional sense someday. I, I know his, his look says it all, <laughs> but that was thought provoking. See, I, so, I, I think so. a structural deformity, which knee arthritis is, is going to require a structural solution. So orthobiologics, I don't think is going to work because the original knee was orthobiologically fine and then it deteriorated. So by doing something to it, when the structure itself is wrong, is not going to work. So this has a limited role of fooling people for a certain number of years until they come to us. So the third point where we did get wrong. <laughs> um, orthobiologics actually comes in when a pre-arthritic condition or early stage uh, disease. So it's more preventative than therapeutic. The other point, which is a bit of uh, anthropometry and evolutionary status, knee joint is the only part of the human anatomy that has still not evolved to its total evolution. And the most recent acquisition of the human anatomy is the introduction of the basket medialis of because the gorilla and the chimpanzees actually don't have that. And this is also, also physiologically at the wrong dimension if you look at any um articulation and you look at the morphology why would an articulation have a concave surface on one side and convex on the other side so this is physiologically unbalanced and unmatched and it is a patent question that the state of evolution of the human anatomy as we talk today 2023 is not complete so the reason why that is there probably philosophy is to allow us to squat. So I don't know any other animal that can sit cross-legged. No, I think I, so think I think that's evolution. I think it is not evolved fully so that we all can make a living. Yeah. Dr. Lin Shah can think 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 different. You can see that. <laughs> and I must admit that I've been frustrated sometimes with new technologies. But I've been extremely disappointed by autobiology during the last 20 years. And I, I used to think that that would be the future, but so it turns out that nothing really new is coming, and we've never been able to prove any real benefit against micro fracture, which is even an older procedure than, than, than mechanical axis in the in the You know what I mean? So Autobiology has certainly a, a place, but I think we say in terms of job for the next 50 yeah. years at least. Right. <laughs> yeah. Because the evolution of actual is so limited, but it took another 5,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> so we have content in short term and ultra long term. So that's reassured. Cementless implants. I know, I think aligned or non aligned on those. Definitely the future of me replacement surgery. And then I subtract to that for yeah, I think I think they will have a place, but they will have a limited role, and uh, cost is will be an issue. So if the cost between a cemented and a cementless is going to be huge, 
I would personally not go for it because cemented has worked so well over the years. 98, 99% survivorship. Then if you can afford to go for it, you can afford it. <laughs> no, that is the other thing that I want to say that my affordability, my patient's affordability is also not a question. We should be thinking of our country's affordability and what message are we sending? And if we are buying these robots and we are asking patients to pay more, where is that money going? Is it helping our country to achieve something? So affordability is one thing. Requirement is another thing. Our understanding is the third thing. And our advice is the fourth thing. And we should be thinking of all these four things as probably motivators. I agree. I think price is what you pay. Value is what you get. I think they have to match. So another of our thing, we think we, we both have worked on this about direct adductor canal blocks, which is surgeon and mister. We think it's a trend. Any takers, any naysayers, surgeon themselves, because he does the was very close to adductor canal. So what I think is that the success of the surgery we are measuring at 10 years and 15 years or 20 years, but in society and in extremely close-knit society that we live in, the success of the operation is measured on the day of surgery by the patient and the patient's relatives, because at least in India, surgery is a social event. People are going to come and visit me. So the opinion about the surgeon is formed not as to how well the knee is aligned, what implant has been put, but whether the person is having pain, not having pain, whether there is nausea, there is no nausea, whether he can bend the knee or whether he can use the washroom. That is why we have titled it Wisdom Studio. You know that? Okay. That's coming straight from heart. So how you see after doing the surgery in the morning, you are seeing patients in the evening in your clinic, but your fate and your future patients are being decided by the person that you have operated and the people who are visiting that person. So how that patient is and how you manage pain is the most important thing. And this should not be left to the ward RMO, should not be left to your registrar, should not be left to the anesthetist, should not be left to the resident anesthetist who is going to see the patient, but is directly your responsibility. Well said. Any comments? Anyone? Except I think it's the true revolution in knee orthoplasty during the last 20 years is uh, the management of the pain. And uh, I can't agree more. And the, the multimodal uh, management that we were talking about earlier is, is a crucial change. And that is a true revolution, as well as tranexamic acid. And, uh, and, and now the, the latest one is the cortisone preoperatively. And, uh, and I, that's things that we really have to do pay attention to. Because it's fundamental for the patient. And we don't want them to keep a bad memory. And I know I understand what you mean by the social event because I'm working in Middle East. It's exactly the same thing. Right? They want to stay because the first day the family is visiting, the next day the, the little bit further the family is visiting, the third day the good friend, the, the fourth day the not as good friends. But if they don't complete this whole path, they won't want to leave. Even though the third day they could leave. But yeah, they're waiting, expecting the shopping meets and everything. So, I mean, they're not going to be before all the friends visit it. It turns out that it's fantastic for marketing. It's much better than the robot because <laughs> when you have 200 visitors for one patient, it's spreading the work. And, and it's it's much better than the robot. <laughs> okay. So, so this is about super regional anesthesia. Yeah. Yeah. Comment. Yes. Mike, Mike, too. Yeah, I totally agree. The has been in pain control and anaxia. But the 
the other side that we have to be aware of is opioid addiction. So if you see the return of a lot of these prescriptions, and then they get actually from you know the standard of it is so much of opioid it's just to sort of pain and keep the patient happy. It does keep them happy, but are we heading towards the US problem? You know, opioid addiction. That is the other part we just have to be aware of. Yeah, point well taken. So one yeah. one comment for one more comment. Yeah. Why well, I just wanted to ask like, uh, why does it have to be surgeon given director block? Why can't it be the anesthetist? Majority of my patients get uh, this uh, arrested block by the anesthetist, ultrasound guided, we are the pioneer. Recovering, and then we make them walk. Is there any reason why you want to be in the... No, so we have the pioneer of that technology here with us and it's improvising technology and that is why it's a trend. So I'll, I'll leave you to answer. He is the one who does, the, I think, the most... Uh, see, I, if you look me up, I have written on femoral nerve blocks. I have published on adductor canal blocks. We have compared adductor canal blocks, single shot and continuous. Then with Vaibhav, we have worked a little bit on direct adductor canal blocks. And now currently we are doing a study in which the surgeon himself, since I do the subvastus approach, the adductor membrane is right in front of me. And if I want to put a catheter in there, it's a simple matter for me to do it. So we are doing a study in which we are comparing anesthetist adductor canal blocks and surgeon administered adductor canal block with catheter. And we must have done around 300 cases so far, and there isn't a lot of difference. So if you have a good anesthetist who can give a block in less than five minutes, and it doesn't disturb your day, then it is good. But if you have 10 cases to do, and the anesthesia and the block is going to take more than your surgical time, then it is not a great thing to do. So, you know, it is just an option. You can choose whoever you are. And the thing is that whatever works in your hands and can deliver the results is the right thing to do. Sir, sir, thank you. I mean, I get my anesthetist to do it in the recovery so that we can cut down on the theater time. So once the patient is shifted out an hour later, the anesthetist will go and then with the sound guided. Usually I get the senior guys to do. But I agree, for a surgeon like you who does the sub probably makes sense to give it at the same time. Thank you. The other trend that we felt will come up is super regional anesthesia, meaning no spinal, no epidural, only blocking multiple nerves for you to do operate and send them early. I do. I think we are far away from it, but that's a trend that is picking up, and we wanted the it to be there on this slide or or this presentation because it's all about telling you what may happen and what is there. That, that's an extension of the IPAC. Yes, it's extension of IPAC, and I think it's one of the catching trends. 3D printed implants. Any takers? Seb. Uh, yeah, I I think we get the technology now. That's a more and more company coming up with 3D printed implant. And we're talking about cementless. I think it's the way to go for cementless because you can you can 3D print a very nice uh, cementless surfaces, and if the cost is is reduced. The next step is to to have 3D printed implants uh, next door. And to remove the stock, to remove the shipment, to remove all this, but it's coming back down to what we we're talking about. What is the ideal implant for which patient? What is the ideal target for which patient? And if you do a 3D printed implant to copy a triathlon or to copy another, it, it makes no sense. Uh, so we really have to work again on what is the target and what are our goals. But the technology is there. Culture specific problems, and we had that. The targets are different. But I think one thing that is catching up is better understanding of what people expect in a particular geography. And that is why we are coming up with culture specific prompts. And I think a lot of our decisions will be guided by what are, and we already know for his decision is guided by what his patient more wants. There's more objectivity to it. So I think that's one of the trends that's catching up people understanding so that it's inbuilt at the very stage of your training until you don't need to become a Nilesh or Ashok Rajapal to understand that. It's there so that you know about it. Any takes, any, anyone? So I, I think in replacement surgery, the key thing is that we should be able to exceed the patient's expectations. So when they are getting the surgery done for whatever reason and whatever their expectations are, 
if we can exceed their expectations, then the patient reported outcome measures are going to be better. So here I would have a little bit of, uh, I would not say a doubt, but a problem that if in robotics, you are, you are telling them that it's you're going to deliver the moon, then their expectations are going to be so high, then for you to exceed the expectations is going to be that way difficult. So I agree. <laughs> Great point. I have nothing an extension of what Bob said. Under promise and over deliver. Also, I think as plastic surgeons, all of us get taken up by uh, review of literature and so on. The important thing is to understand that this is a man made joint, whether it's customized or what, whichever delivered to orthopedic, it's not a positive joint. We never going to be able to reproduce normal function. Also, Outcomes are dependent not only on the skill of how you well or what implant you use or what technology you use. It's also dictated by the morphology of the soft tissue of the particular individual. You can do a knee really well, end up with also fibrosis. And these are the patients who are delivered well with mal without malnutrition. Also, the fact that you know everybody talks about this all the time. It's obsession for greater ranges of movements. There are patients who start stiff, will end up stiff. A patient with a 30 degree pre in the moment will never get to 120 or 130. So I think managing patient expectations is a very important, particularly leading to, uh, to Nilan's point that you deliver and be constant your patient and tell them what to expect at the end of the day. I agree. And I'll take this question because I do. Almost 99% of my patients are not robotically. And I'm asked that by my fellows, my residents, even by patients, that will robotic do the magic? And I always ask them this question. What's the most important thing when you drive? Anyone? Driver. 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 Anyone else? Want to take what's the most important thing? Destination. Safety. Destination. 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 Anyone else? So the um, yes, the correct answer is where to go. Everything else that you do can be taken care of. Okay, you can have a Maruti 800 and you can have a BMW. Unless you know where to go, it's of no use. Even if you didn't have a car, you can hire an Uber. You can have a PSI. You can have a fellow operating. You can have another surgeon. In India, there's a trend of most surgeons operating. So all of that is possible as long as you know what you want to get it done. And I think that's true with any technology. So you always promise that I'll take you there. I have got different means to take you there. I've got better cars to take you there, but my destination will not change with no matter what I use. And I think that's the critical point. And I think that's the summary of the entire debate. Know where you want to go. I think we put this because infection was one of the topics that was left and uh, we've also got responsible. But I think one of the things that is happening is that we all want quick diagnosis for the infections. And I think this is one of the technology. We have it here. I have used it. And I'm personally a great fan because within one hour, when you're operating, you get 39 commonest PGI uh, pathogens delivered to almost a sensitivity of above 95%, is what they claim. So I think this is one of the future trends for diagnosing PGIs. Anyone who has another experience or want to comment on you? We have used this. We have used this and we have exactly the same experience. It is a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal target. Dr. Bosley, yeah, yeah. we are using it. And you are happy, you, you feel that this is the future of PGI? I think coming up in your Okay, and so I think yes, it's the trend. Yeah. See, I have not used this, so just tell me what is this? It is when you, when you are operating, you send the synovial fluid or something, or what is this? So, yeah, so it's, 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 it's a like a pregnancy test. Okay. So instead of urine, you take the synovial fluid. You put it on your on your thing, plus minus, it's telling you it doesn't turn on. No, it, it, it's, it's beyond that. Know. It's much beyond that. It will tell you which organism it is. Yes, right. So it, it will tell you the DNA. So even a single strand of DNA will be picked up by the technology. So unlike the other tests, which were like a UV, uh, where it's say plus or minus, it will actually tell you which organism so that you can start the antibiotic if that's it. And because they will also detect the dead organisms, so that if someone is on an antibiotic, and they have got a DNA remaining, it, it will still be picked up. So I think. Cost Krishna, is how much? How relevant is it in the setting of uh, normal ESR, CRT, B dimer, and then they do clinical 
what would be entailed to you as a surgeon? I don't know. I, I so I will do it now with all my revisions. All so my revisions. So it would come positive of something. It looks good. Would so, you abandon the surgery or you, you, you know, put the patient on a particular antibiotic for it or you just put a spacer, go back and... Uh, so again, so the whole debate of single stage division versus dual stage division was being able to identify the organism. You are able to identify the organism on table. If it is quite in joint, you had gone in for a replacement, incidentally detected, treat it like a single stage because you have now have a bug. You know, you can give a wrong stage. So it's more data, more objectivity, more information than to know it three to six weeks later that, oh God, this was this. So, and yeah. it's also objectively the challenge that we have and we're doing aseptic revisions. And you take a culture at that point of time and you come out 72 hours later and you go above. So this, I mean, we do this uh, pretty much regularly. Any revisions will undergo uh, aspiration. I mean, if we be got this, we will bring aspiration cultures and so on, CRP and so on. Uh, but to your point, CRP and ESR is the mainstay. That is your bottom line. You don't run away from your this is just added information. It gives you the options of being able to uh, identify whether or not you are dealing with a subclinical infection. Yes, yeah, it's not Thank you. Well, why I asked that was. There are a lot of cases where kids are borderline, where the ESR and CRP are not you know, normal. But there is a decreasing trend, and we can mix out and we're going to have the CRP not now become normal with the PGI standards, but it's really it it's, it's Yeah, so, so exactly. So you are, if, because it has such a high sensitivity, you can rest assured that it's there. And if it is there, you know what organism it is. You can start an extended, you can start your one stage revision protocol. But by bow, by bow, in a in a joint, which is say a little bit puffy, you do this and you get some organism. Does it necessarily mean that the joint is septic? It means that the organism was there or is there. Two things. You decide what you want to do. What you want to do. Yes. Synovium is supposed to be a sterile. If you have aspirated it correctly and you have it, either it was or it is. Because to my understanding, a lot of the joints may be contaminated, but they don't come up with infection. So whether we would overdiagnose things or not. That's open to the thing. So yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll just so it depends on different things. Here it costs 16,000. I don't know about different places. We are stopping it. We'll we go ahead because the boss says that we need to move ahead. So open source robotic, very close to my heart, at least I think that um, as sir said that we have to understand about the country. I think the way to bring down the capex is to have open source so that the surgeons have freedom to choose their implant and the companies can build for the hardware, which is all across surgeons, all across spectrum. But open, I know uh, Seb made a comment, it's anti-capitalism, but uh, it's a very strong words, but open for discussion. I think we, I mean, what implant you put should be the choice of the surgeon. What technology you use also should be the choice of the surgeon. But irrespective of what phone you use, the cell phone carrier should allow everyone to be used. Okay. So that was the thought process. But yes, uh, SEP or now, now free portability is, uh, is universal. So I think that's the way that we should go. I think it's the way it should go. I'm a little bit more pessimistic in terms of. Is it possible to 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 actually be uh, to come because of the because of the market? Because so far, all the companies that try to produce assistive technologies without a link with the implants fail, and that's why I'm so concerned. But I love the idea. Okay. And the final, the most thought provoking: Will we ever have surgeonless theaters? I know we have had enough discussions. It's just a provoke. If yes, when? If no, ever. Yeah, the why is why is obviously we don't want it. Why should we have it? I agree. But will we have it? You, you fly a plane when you go to anywhere in the world. I don't I don't ask who is the pilot. No, but would you fly the plane no. without the pilot in the plane? Yes, I would. You would? Okay. Yeah. How long are how long, since how long do they use uh, autopilot and this type of tools? 
in the place. Maybe 25 40 years, 30 years. 40 years. For 40 years. Yeah. For the case, huh? Yeah. Starting. Many, yeah. How many flights per day? How many data? Can you imagine the time that you will need for, for, for surgery to be like that? And they know where to go since the day one. Why do you don't know what the coming is? Yeah. But you should also <laughs> ask the pilots. Yeah, that's the exact argument. Will we become like pilots? Because most I've flown today, most pilots today just sit back and ensure that everything is in order. And that's what pilots do. We are heading the same way. And that's why in provocation. And deliberate trend for provocation, you ask pilot, and if you fly today, you ask them, I do. And so I know in today's world, what most pilots do is because we are still as humans not comfortable letting it be driverless. But it is practically driverless. It can be driverless. We can, if we are allowing driverless cars, the flights are much more safer. Indian roads are running out driverless cars. <laughs> They are trying. I Viper, Viper, what I think is that what we do, surgery is just one aspect of the care that we give. So whether the theater is surgeonless or is not surgeonless, the consultation, how we talk to the patient, how we look after the patient afterwards, all that is the surgeon is involved. <laughs> I was only talking about theater. Surgeons will always <laughs> be end point. It's surgeon and, is, but probably the chief surgeon does not need to be there. Okay. Yeah. And I'll just give you a glimpse. We had a very, a very elegant thing why he said. He said, chat GPT. And see how the difference is. He said, chat GPT does, does give you only a few answers. Okay. So it depends on the question you ask. So after last night, I also asked chat GPT this question. And you'll see why I put word in place. I had two best minds. I'd ask the question to two best minds. Okay. okay. What are the top 10 technology trends? And I ask very specific questions, chat GPT. So the answers you get depend on the questions you ask, just like robotics. Okay. Just see what chat GPT has shown up and my slides. Exact same. And these two didn't know that I've asked chat GPT. This is a real time video. You can see the time up there. Today morning, 5 30. Exact same. So I'll leave you with this thought process. It's there. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. We take a five minute break, coffee, coffee, yes, yeah, and then we and five minute break, and then we reassemble for the next and the final session.
so we are into the last session uh, may i request uh, the chairperson dr pradeep bosle and uh, dr nilin shah uh, to start the proceedings for the last session um it was a really wonderful conference i am uh, really enjoying it and uh, the next session is also very interesting uh, it's on revision tkr and uh, i'll call the first expert uh, dr ashok ps on revision armamentarium yep good morning good morning chairman yeah so thanks again for dr ashok raj gopal nilin shah sir and vaibhav so tk revision ornamentarium so we have to best first understand the primary failure explantation preparation reimplantation so basic things in revision ornamentarium explantation so understanding the primary failure the cause of failure mode of failure and previous implant design its ps cr and clinical assessment to determine the stability we should not miss the clinical assessment like hip and spine pathology blood workup radiological assessment x rays cts and mri if necessary angiograms if gross uh, wares are there 3d modeling keep in back of mind 3d printing implants keep it on back of mind technological instruments if necessary so clinical assessment plays a clear basic role in revision ornamentarium you should not miss this step this gives idea this gives idea so we divide into intraoperative steps exposure debridement reconstruction ligament balancing implantation closure so revision everything plays vital role we have to look at intraoperative decisions and intraoperative steps so if you see the exposure very important skin incision length can be as needed so there is no mis incision length as needed for the patient and as needed for surgeon as well and carefully mobilize the skin edges so if we tell the what is the best thing for revision exposure and the best approach i don't know but nilin shah sir medial parapotlar is the best so that it's already scarred you can have standard approach so mobilize the edges carefully identify the old sutures which is there so that gives a good landmarks for you to go back to the joint so mobilize under the patella do a synovectomy clear the gutters very important this is very important in any revision total synovectomy this helps you to train when doing infection case also if it's not able to flex it need a pair snip as gradually bend it and see then you may require a cordyceps snip even the strip the snip is not working then you should go for tto basically tto can be decided in the step before the stiff knee so this is what exposure required in a tkr in revision so debridement has to be debrided completely like infection remove all the material synovectomy fibrous membrane supra patellar medial lateral gutters and excise a pcl you cannot play your you are retain a pcl surgeon or you have to excise osteophytes and bone debridement the instruments expand instruments is very important the acl saw blade which plays a very role i'll show you a couple of slides different types of or, uh, osteotomes retrograde punches and burr this is where the burr also helps you very well use the acl saw blade to get the metal cement interface this is how it has been metal and the cement interface if you see even as well as in the 
Okuyayım bu. Bakın kolikten bir kadar küçük bir yumur. Yumur sütü tablet. Şimdiden tanım mesaj interface. So use once you done the ACL saw blades, yeah. use the osteotomes. There are different broad <laughs> yeah, okay. arrow. Use these osteotomes to guidely get into the interface. Keep patience. So nothing to be uh, doing such in 45 minutes or one hour. Gradually get into it. Progressively, both the sides. So here you can see that cement and the femur is trying to. Or block it. Be carefully have a hook. Just gently deliver it. Then try to tap it out. Now you tap it out. This is the best way to take the expand the implant. If you see the femoral and tibial, similar way. If I have a revision implants inside. If you have revision implant, again, steps are the same, gradually, keep the retrograde osteotomes, or probes, slowly tap it. You see, you can see two surgeons are working, gradual manner, so the entire stem with the tibia comes out. The punched osteotomes. So just be patient. This is the heart of the surgery divisions. Getting these implants in right so that the further planning will be much better. Similarly, even you have a femoral implant, once you do the interface, use the punch osteoclast. Simultaneously, working together, take a hand keep on the both the sides, slowly tap it, irrespective of the stem inside the canal. Simple tapping, patiently, it gets you the entire implant without much of bone loss. So again, tibial removal, use best instruments, even the femur without bone loss. So working together is the best. And the best treatment prevention is during the process of revision surgery, protect the cordyceps mechanism, educate exposure, mobilize the petula, pin the tibial tubercle if necessary, careful retraction, watch your saw blade when you're cutting, minimize the petula trauma. So last, we go to re-implantation. We'll go the basic principles in re-implantation then into the detail. Our aim, you should have this X-ray you know, or where you're going to fix. The zones of fixation, the zone one is epiphysis articular, zone two is metaphysis, zone three diaphysis. So we need a solid fixation to obtain at least two of these zones. So bone defects in revision, total orthopedicity, based on the bone defect, as well as the soft tissue we have to plan your implant selection. So zone one is most of things are destroyed because of removal. Cement is the best in this zone. If you use augments, it needs to be, uh, get fixation in another zone, zone two or one. So joint surface is zone one. It allows good for stabilizing the diaphysal stems one and three. Whereas metaphysal, as the zone indicates, this zone is a crucial restoration of the joint line. Most revisions achieve stability in combination of zone one and zone three. Fixation in zone two allows shorter stem of the diaphysal. When use of metaphysal sleeves or cones, shorter stems can be used. If you have sleeves and cones, sleeves get a better direct immediate fixation. Cones just gives a support to you. So it's based on the patients what required. Diaphysal zones are the stems. It can be Use of stems is very important. You have to centralize, educate length, optimal diameter, ensure that alignments are there. So we have cemented and uncemented stems. So you can decide based on the patient's residual bone quality and any history of pre-infection, you can decide what stems can be used. So if you have a gross laxity in spinal pathology and you need a higher level of constraint like revision hinge processes. So reconstruction, fixation, revision TK is a great importance. Concept of zonal fixation provides a good working. And the classification allows both for cemented and uncemented fixation. Most revisions require a combination approach of fixation and multi-zone strategy for should be avoided, uh, adopted. During process of pre-plan, planning, three questions, which zone, which fixation, 
which implants are going to use it. Failure to ask these questions uh, preoperatively could lead to the inadequate fixation, uh, ultimately early failure. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok Bhai. Fantastic talk. If there is any burning question from anybody. Okay. Pradeep says the questions will be at the end. So now, do I see Dr. Narendra Vaidya here? Revision techniques and technology. He's not here. Then we move on to the next topic. I would ask Dr. Sanjay Agarwala. Give us talk on newer bearing surfaces and body options. Thank you, Nilayan. Thank you, Ashok. Thank you, Weber, for this invitation today to speak in this meeting. The ideal biomaterial is biocompatible, clearly, so it works. It's friction resistant, corrosion resistant with good mechanical strength to take the body weight. And here you can see on the right hand side how you have a material which tends to flake off if you use this in your kitchen. And the bearing surfaces are mainly three. We will not discuss the patella. It's the femoral, the polyethylene component, and the tibial component. And of this, the polyethylene component, and choosing the right would mean the difference between a long-term performance and the premature need for revision surgery. And of this, the implant design and the material properties are something that you can elect to choose. Whereas the other things like the processing, the patient, the packaging, sterilization is something that happens directly from the company. The Insole Award paper of 202 talked about why total knee arthroplasties were failing. And this is 20 years ago. And the reason was essentially polyethylene wear. The rest of the things of loosening, instability, infections, et cetera, were a smaller component of the problem. And why does polyethylene wear happen? There's adhesive wear where the coefficient of friction peels off the polyethylene. There's abrasive wear, which is due to the scratches. And you're very careful when you implant the, uh, the knee in, you make sure there is no third body wear, et cetera, because that would tend to wear away the polyethylene. And the fatigue wear clearly, just like a uh, pin, if you break it, you, to break it, you move it, you get uh, stress and fatigue, that too causes the wear of the polyethylene. The conventional polyethylene you all have used and are aware of. This term, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, we all are aware of, and your companies offer this. Then you have XLPE, the highly cross-linked, and then vitamin E infused. These are the four main ones that I will discuss very briefly. Polyethylene, of course, we've seen from Charlie's time is excellent, low friction, high impact resistance, self-lubricating su surface, etc. And there's no temperature sensitivity in the human biological environment. The ultra high molecular weight polyethylene is something with molecular weight, which is more than 3.1 million grams per mole. It is better, 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 better. The highly cross-linked, and what is the difference here? It was first introduced in the 70s, and there is a 90% decrease in wear rate with increasing of the cross-linkage in the molecules of polyethylene. The cross-linking of polyethylene increases the wear resistance, but decreases the mechanical strength. And the ideal one would be that which increases the resistance and the mechanical strength. The newer generations of polyethylene have methods to remove the free radicals without affecting the mechanical strength. They anneal before, below the melting point. They melt it after the irradiation so that it all coheses together. 
and add a free radical scavenger like vitamin E is excellent for hips, but hasn't proven to be so good for the knees, which is what we're talking about today. And the primary disadvantage is that the cross link density decreases and hence it is not as strong as you want it to be. The materials for the femoral component, however, we all are aware of the chromium cobalt, the workhorse, ceramic, the Japanese use the ceramic, auxilium, which is available in India and the coated metals, again, available in India. And the cobalt chromium continues to be the most widely used. There's mechanical wear, corrosion, allergy, and is it a carcinogen? Probably a little highly overstated because we've used this for years. The ceramic bearing surfaces, and believe it or not, the Japanese feel this works very well. There's good wear resistance, but there would be brittleness. And if you tap this too hard, would it break? Well, at the configuration like this, it might, though in the hip, it works extremely well because it is enclosed. And the Japanese, as I said, have described this and feel that it works in 223 total knees with ceramic femoral components. Survivorship at six years was considered very good. And now I'm sure there are more papers suggesting it works, but it isn't still available to surgeons like us. The zirconium and auxilium, something that I use, and I, some of you must be using this, it is a methodology of creating the surface of your implant with polished auxilium and gives better mechanical strength and better wear resistance. In fact, this, the company claims, works for 30 years. And uh, it is not a coating, unlike some of the others. There's decreased friction, and it reduces the adhesive polyethylene wear. Made by one of the companies, Smith & Nephew, and as I said, I have been using it both for the hip and for the knee, and seems to work very well. The increased surface hardness is twice that of cast chromium Cobalt, cobalt chromium, and it reduces the wear rate, which makes this extremely useful to last longer. Metal, metal sensitivity is also less because it does not have nickel. And the advantages over a ceramic is that it has better strength being metal. This shows how Auxinium is better than the cobalt chrome in hips, and their published data has shown that 15 million cycles, which is a cycle for a year, 45 million cycles is how much this would last used against a polyethylene. The 30 year simulation results have been well published and demonstrably this should work better, but we'll come to this. And clinical data, right, likewise, is excellent. The coefficient of friction, as I said, is less. The abrasive wear is better. And the fatigue cycle permits this to be used for a longer period of time. Companies also have what they call the gold knee. This is multiple layers of layers applied on the knee. The femoral component and the tibial component are made with this material. It is twice as hard as auxinium and eight times harder than cobalt chrome. It reduces the abrasive PE wear, therefore, and the wetting angle is improved by 20%. The allergy prevention here is more, they claim, because the tibia also is made of the same material. However, the tibia is not an articulating surface, so it is debatable whether this is really a great advantage. It has outstanding biocompatibility, and as I said, is allergy preventive, higher wettability with cyanable fluid, and low friction, et cetera, which makes this a very good implant. The clinical data, which has been presented by papers which have come from the company, suggests that 90% survival is very good. 
A similar layer was available in the Columbus knee, which is no longer available in India. And these seven layers likewise made this a highly useful knee. However, there have been papers of the coating coming off, wearing out, and therefore this 21% coating delamination made this controversial at one point in time. What is the registry data regarding all these materials and all these knees? There is no difference in revision rate between coated and uncoated implants. There's no difference in revision rate between different types of coating. In fact, this is a knee that I put in about 18 years ago. Long before the auxinium was available, the company would give me non-auxinium knees. It's doing well 18 years down the line. So the take home message here is that do what you do best. It really doesn't matter. And if you have the right implants, presumably the ones which last longer will last longer, but the data from the registry does not support having more expensive implants. Thank you. Thank you very much. I invite the next speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Sebastian. Uh, he will be talking on tips, tricks, and traps for revision knee. This one? No, no, that, this one. In the center one. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for your. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your invitation again. It's my last uh, talk in the official session, and it has been my my great pleasure. Uh, thank you, Ashok, for inviting me. Like I said yesterday, we usually see each other in the the, the other parts of the world, and I have had the great opportunity to come to India to meet uh, other friends. Sorry, we don't have a picture together. You were busy all the time in the OR. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, thank you. Thank you again for having me. I had, a, I had a great time. So we're going to talk about things, real stuff. Okay, We're not talking about the robot. We're not talking about two millimeters more or less. We're not talking about two degrees more or less. We're talking about real stuff. It's when the knee is looking at us. And it's not fun. Trust me, when it's like that, you know that it's going to be a terrible day. And even if you put a nice mouth on it uh, with a lot of lipsticks, it's not going to be more charming. And you know that it's going to be tough. So back to the basic. There's five basic. And uh, Ashok, the other one, told us that no diagnosis, no revision. It's very important to know that if you go inside to do the so-called open and shuf, shuf means look at it something in, in Arabic, it's not good. To find the cause of the revision inside the surgery, no, you don't do that. This is the historical paper, but all the other papers have shown that no diagnosis, no revision. You have to know that you have to do just enough, but not too much. It's a compromise between stability, mobility, which is related to the constraint, the alignment, the fixation. And once again, as a surgeon, your experience is gonna help you to decide what is the best compromise for each patient. You have to ask yourself important question before going inside, because when you are inside with the knee open, it's too late. The patient, age, expectations, muscles, what is the cause of the failure? Is there an infection? Which approach am I going to choose? How am I going to deal with the bone loss? How am I going to deal with the ligament? What is the status of the extensor mechanism? And how is the skin and the, skin, the tough tissue coverage? Should I call my friend plastic surgeon ahead of the surgery? Or will I be able to manage myself? And of course, as surgeon, we always think about implant and fixation. All right, if you already think about it, it's great because I've seen many cases where the surgeon were already in surgery without requesting for the RHK or the segmental prosthesis. And you're like, wow, what can I put in there? A PSD is never gonna work there. So we don't have all the sets available all the time in our hospital, depending on the volume. 
So you have to make sure that you ask your rep to bring you in what you need. I've heard many times the classical quote, choose the lowest constraint possible. It's not always true. It's better when you have an MCL deficiency to put a nice RHK, well implanted, well seated, rather than uh, uh, having another revision within uh, uh, next year for um, uh, instability again. So the number, the last one is planning is the key. You have to know exactly what you're gonna do before going inside because it's already gonna be a two hour surgery. So if you have to ask yourself within the surgery, what you have to do, it's too late. It's gonna to take too much time for all these points. The first step also is to choose the constraint. You have to know perfectly well which stabilizer is gonna be involved at which degrees of deflection. And you have to know whether it's still here or not. And this is all about the preoperative testing. And it's very important to do that in the clinic, even if it's not always easy. Why? Because that's how and when you're gonna order for the implants that you need for the particular revision. Inside the OR, it's too late. Or you can ask your rep to bring the CCK, the RHK, the segmental. He's gonna do that once, but the next time it's never gonna come because he's gonna hate you and your staff too, because it's 17 trays. You have to see whether the collateral ligaments are present or not. And even if they are present, sometimes you need CCK type of implant for the reconstruction purposes, to be able to add a stem, to be able to add augments, to be able to add cones. So it's very important even if you use that with a PS liner. So look at the ligaments on the X-ray. If you need a CT scan, you can have a CT scan to see better the osteolysis process and look at the capsule, look at the ligament. If they are gone, once again, don't be afraid of using a nice RHK. We now have a, a track record of rotating hinge knees with a long-term follow-up and it's working well. Robert Ubel showed that one of the most consequences, one of the most frequent cause of re-revision is instability. So you don't want to do an instability, you don't want to treat a patient for an instability problem without addressing the problem and without making sure that this is the last revision. Be careful at the posterior capsule. Sometimes when you do extensive releases or when there's no posterior capsule anymore, you need to use an RHK. And if you need to go back after a fixed spacer or for a complex case, do not be afraid as well to use an RHK because you will have to release this need to gain the flexion back. So don't be afraid of that. You see, sometimes there's ouais, nothing left. Le, le. You have to use a, 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 a CSS or segmental system. And once again, don't be afraid of that. It's better to do that sometimes, sometimes in very particular cases, rather than keeping your all infected distal femur. So sometimes you have to do what you have to do. Be prepared, this is the message. The restoration of the joint line is fundamental. It's easy or it's, I mean, it's easy. It's easier in primary cases, but in revision, it's not always easy. And you think that this case is a very simple one. No problem, simple PS knee before. But if you look at the X-ray carefully, you will see that it was a 17 polyethylene already because of this device. You know, it's a 17 polyethylene. Plus you refresh cut. That means that you're gonna be very low. So either you put a 25 polyethylene, which is absolutely not good for the long-term follow-up, or you reconstruct and you rebuild your TBL plateau. But if you do so, you have to make sure that you have all the tools at your disposal to do so. And I like to do that with cones because it's the best way to do that to me based on the literature. And that's why you have to plan that in advance. It's not always easy to find the landmarks. And there's one that is very helpful on the tibial side is the head of the tibial, the head of the fibula head. You always find that and you know that you have to be 10, 10 millimeters above that. That's very nicely described by our friend, Emmanuel Timpont, uh, a landmark for the femur. But to me, it's, it's very hard to find. And most of the time in real revisions, you don't have that anymore. So how to do that? You always have to think about the Kelly Vins technique. You will have to think that you have to restore the TBL platform, control the flexion space, how by deciding which one is the best femoral size, and you have to control the extension space, how by distalization of the femur. So these are the principles, but how do you do that practically speaking? I used to, I love to use what I call the trial technique. So basically I'm gonna temporarily restore my TBL platform. I don't care about the bone void. I don't care about anything. I just put a TBL plateau at the level that I estimate to be the good one based on, on the landmark that I showed you before, the 10 millimeter of the fibula head. Then I choose my femoral size based on the implant that I removed and based on the CT scan that I had to know if the coverage was good or not. 
So I'm going to do that very simply. Then very roughly, without doing any cut, without doing anything, I'm going to do a temporary trial. What is that? I'm just inserting my, TV, my femoral trial. You see, I don't care about the lateralization. I don't care about the impingement. I don't care about anything. I just put my femoral component where I can put it actually without doing any cut or anything. Then I'm going to take the smallest polyethylene that I have at my disposal. I don't put any PS, I don't put any RHK, I don't put anything. And then I'm gonna do my trials. I'm gonna see whether I can get extension. I'm gonna see whether I'm balanced in extension. I'm gonna see whether I, I have a good stability in flexion and if I have a good battle of mold tracking. So I'm gonna check these points. And based on that, like I said, if I'm losing flexion and extension, I know my TBL platform is not high enough. If I don't have the full extension, I know that my femur is not proximalized enough, which is very the case. Most of the time, it's not distalized enough. Huh? So based on that, I can adapt my reconstruction. And then I'm gonna do my final reconstruction with all the things that we're gonna see in a moment. But these temporary trial reduction things, to me, change completely the way of doing revision. I earned a lot of time because I know exactly what I have to do and what I have to uh, uh, do uh, better uh, uh, to optimize the patellar tracking and everything. And you see, after you do your whole entire reconstruction, but you know your landmarks, you know your functional positioning of the implant, you have a perfect patellar tracking, you have no surprise at the end when you reduce everything. Once you know where is your joint line, you're gonna say, hey, but Seb, I put my tibia here, but there's a big hole in there. What do I do? You have to manage the bone loss and the fixation. Ashok showed us a very nice classification, but it's it's very it's good for 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 sorry Ashok it's good for publication. But in the real life, there's two situations: whether it's a hole, it's a cavitary defect, so you have to fill it up, or it's a segmental defect, and then you have to rebuild. There's no wall anymore, so you have to rebuild. So these are the two situations. Three final goals: you want a good stability of the implant, you want a genline restoration, as we just spoke about before and some mechanical axis restoration. The challenge is that if you put your classic implant, you put some cement, you put everything that you have in your armamentarium, boom, it's gonna fail very quickly. Sometimes it's failing this way as well. So during years, we have had a brilliant idea is to do a hip in a knee. What did we do? We did diaphysal fixation. So we put big stem saying, okay, no problem. We're gonna put a big stem. We're gonna get the fixation here. And we're gonna put whatever we have here, like uh, allograph, cement, whatever we have. And the problem is that the patient were coming back with a terrible pain, not in the knee, but here. Doctor, my muscles are very painful here. Yeah, your muscles, sure. You look at the X-ray, there's a big stress shielding, and you know that there's a tip stem, tip of the stem impingement. That's why the concept changed. And Ashok showed us to us before. This is the paper of reference. And if you have to remember one thing in this talk, this is this, the zonal fixation. This is crucial. The zone one is the epiphysal area. The zone two is the metaphysis. The zone three is the diaphysis. It's really a, a classification for orthopedic surgeons. Three zones, you cannot tell me that you're gonna forget that. But it's crucial because if you remember that you have to have at least two zones, you're good. Why? Because in, in reconstruction, there's no epiphysis. So the secondary rules, are ah, forgot about that. But remember, you need at least to have the metaphysal fixation and the diaphysal fixation. How? By using cones and stems. Which stems? Some people are putting long stem and cemented. Some others are putting cemented stem, shorter. So what am I going to use? I love to use cones. I love to use trabecular metal. And now companies are are all distributing these kind of cones and trabecular metals. I'm used to use the original one. Why? Because we published a lot. It can be also, it can carry antibiotics and deliver antibiotics. It's a very good product for that. And it's by, it's, 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 it's alive. So it's gonna be, again, it's gonna be alive. So I move from the long stem, uncemented stem, to cones plus shorter stem for the reason that I mentioned. I was tired of seeing my patient, my knee is fine though, but my tibia is painful, my femur is painful. So we moved to the Mayo School team with shorter stem and I learned that with Arlen Hansen and Matthew Abdel to shorten the stem. And we publish our results of the patient that when I was still in Marseille that we operated on with shorter stem cones compared to long stem with cones and compared to long stem without cones. You get me? 
the best results in terms of clinical results, radiological results, and survivorship where we've shorter stem, fully cemented, and coats. Why? Because you avoid the tip stem pain because you get a better rotation fixation for the shorter cemented stem and you get the reconstruction with the cones. There's one exception where you have to go longer is when you have a cortical defect and then you have to bridge this cortical defect. So you cannot afford to put a short cemented stem with a cone. This is the only kind of exception. And we came up with this classification that we are about to publish, which is a kind of algorithm for the choice stem in neatoplasty based on the bone loss, based on an eventual uh, cortical defect, and then you know what to bridge and what to use. So it's very helpful. The last part after managing the joint line, the bone loss and the fixation, if you have no engine, it's not gonna work. So you need a good extensor mechanism. And we published the result of that for the chronic insufficiency of the extensor mechanism. It's very important to make sure that you have everything ready because there's two techniques that you can use and you have to be prepared for that. It's the so-called Marlax technique. It's a mesh, you know, the abdominal mesh that the, 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 the general surgeon are using. You roll it, you fix it on the tibia, you cement it, and then you pass it around the retinaculum and you pull it towards the quadriceps. It's very well described in the GBGS by uh, Matthew Abdel and Arlen Hansen. There's now more than 15 years result about this technique. Just one point, only one brand is working. I've tried with other brands, I've had some ruptures, and the brand, the good brand is Bard Medical. Last point, allograft, when you don't have this, allograft is great as well. You do total extensor mechanism. It's only possible if the stibia is still okay, which is not always the case. The algorithm is simple, acute, chronic, is there still a correct patella? If yes, you can do the Marlax. If there's no tibia, no patella, and if there's still a proximal tibia, you can do the Marlax or the complete extensor allograft. And if there's no proximal tibia anymore, as I showed before, you have to do a Marlax plus the gastrocnemius you slap, which is very important. So be prepared. Make sure that you have everything ready, all the armamentarium that you need that Ashok presented to us. Think about the joint line restoration, the bone loss, constraint in the stem, and the extensor mechanism. Thank you very much for your attention and invite you to the uh, WAC meeting uh, in uh, Madrid in 2024. Uh, it's a combined organization between the European Knee Society, the CCGR, and the International Orthopedic Educational Network. Uh, Ashok is very involved in the European Knee Society as well, and I thank him for that very active international member. So we are, we will be very happy to see you in, uh, in Madrid in 2024. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Ben. This was a very, very erudite presentation. And I would say that one of your comments about separating the boys from the men is not just the cost of their toys, but how the boys all men yes, handle their divisions. Now, uh, unfortunately, we have no time for uh, discussion because we are running out of time and we will move on to the case discussion. So I invite Dr. Ashish Vardis and Dr. Anu to conduct the next session. You have around 13 minutes. Okay, 10 minutes. Yeah, sure. Sure. Noted, sir. So let me thank uh, uh, Dr. Ashok Rajgopal, sir, Dr. Nilain Shah, sir, and Dr. Bagaria, sir, for a wonderful, much needed conference in today's times. And uh, without much ado, we go on to the case. So, so this is a 67 year old uh, uh, lady who, who was operated by a bilateral PKR in 2015. She was okay a year after surgery when she tore her MCL on the left side and she was put in on a hinge brace. This was a one year follow-up x-ray. And then she comes uh, to me eight years later with her knee in 10 degrees of hyperextension fixed, no movement at all. Okay, and she's been working on that uh, since the past eight years. These are her current x-rays, the erect x-rays, the AP and the lateral, and the val valgus and varus stress x-ray. This is the LCSRP uh, sigma that was used. 
So the only expectation that the patient has is, uh, doctor, I just want to sit in the car uh, with some amount of flexion. I've, I've had enough of this knee, which is fixed in hyperextension. And this is her scar status. You've got multiple scars going through. And uh, this is her, her uh, side profile. The skin is off the bed. Okay. She's locked in hyperextension. And you've got those multiple heel scars. She also reported of some kind of discharge from the medial scar site. Though at this point of time, her inflammatory markers were negative. And uh, how do we plan further? This was her gait. Pretty much walks uh, with a log, locked knee gait. So we come to the problems on hand. Which scar do we use? What approach do we use? Would we able to uh, expose the knee better? What would be the sequence and what would be the implant choice and what would be the rehab protocol? Yeah. What is the cause? Immobilization. She, she was put in a brace for over three months. She was not on rehab. She had got repeated. So she was put on a brace for two months. Then she started walking. Again, she had some instability. The surgeon then said that you need to be in a brace for a longer time uh, because she had got some infection. He was reluctant to go in earlier. That's what I preempt was the cause uh, of, of uh, lack of rehab and mobilization. At this point of time, everything was normal. So it was, it was, yes. So there is some kind of notching. We expected some loosening. Therefore, it did some stress x-rays. This is, so ESR was around 24. CRP was negative. Counts were around 7,000. Exactly. So, uh, taking leads from uh, Sir's wisdom, uh, I, I did not promise her a lot. I expected that whatever flexion you get would be a bonus. Yes, sir. Quadriceps power could not be judged because there's no mobility. Hello. Yes, sir. You have postural lysis in the posterior. Yes, on the posterior lysis in the posterior. Yes, sir. That is the first indicator that that knee is loose. You're talking about infection, some discharge. The other thing which is significant here is you look at the height of the body. That's a massive area. And you combine all these three factors together. This patient is infected most likely out of the substantial uh, arthrofibrosis. And I think somewhere along the line, also one of these components is malnutrition. And you would say that because you have an absolutely perfect AP on the tibia and the femur, and look at the incursion state below. So there is, there is certainly a concentration of malnutrition. All right, sir. So the femur appears to be loose. You can see that on the lateral and the AP x ray. You get some amount of radial lucency, which has been static since the past eight years, uh, which is not opening out on the tibia. So when you have a stiff knee, it's very difficult to assess uh, clinically if the if the implants are loose or radiologically, they 100% appear to be loose. So we had uh, preempted that the femoral component would be loose, tibia also might be loose, but uh, unless we expose, we won't be able to explain them. So serologically, she was negative. We tried to aspirate it, it was a dry tap. We sent her again for a UHG guided trap, uh, tapping. It was again negative. Hence, we embarked on the on the process that she would be a septic at this point of time, and then we planned for a revision. Yeah. So, is the AVM uh, post-op? Right? So, she's stiff since the first year. Yes, yeah. so after the, the first to second year. That's that's the history that she gives. I know. Tell us what she did. Yeah. So, so we we went down with the lateral most approach uh, for the exposure. We, I chose the quadriceps snip amongst all the other approaches. So once we, we, we did the snip, uh, we, we got that most of these adhesions were retropatellar and in the suprapatellar region. Once we released that, uh, the quadriceps snip, you realize that the implants are unstable. The joint was unstable. This is hyperextension, uh, block. We could get flexion to about 30 degrees with the quadriceps snip alone. So then when we went into the uh, suprapatellar region and we released those adhesions, we could manage uh, a flexion of about 100 degrees, 95 to 100 degrees. That's only on exposure. Then what we did was a standard, we, we removed the poly, uh, we explanted the 
the tissues. Considering that the MCL was damaged, the plan was an RHK. Uh, so as, as we got that the, the TBL augmentation was required in this particular situation to get the joint line oriented, we used a shim there, and this is the RHK uh, in place. So that's where, what we have done. And this is here at two months. Uh, I never expected this to happen, but at two months, she came back with 90 degrees of flexion. And that's how she's walking at two months. So from my perspective, uh, since we did not get a bug, we sent intraoperative samples as well, which did not grow, did not grow a bug. I still kept her on for antibiotics for about two weeks. I, I marked some redness there, and again, I, I asked her to follow up without an antibiotic. We repeated uh, ESR, CRP, and counts profile at two, uh, a month after her, her first follow-up, and that also came negative. She's now settled. I hope that we have a longer follow-up. Great case. Uh, Ashish, do you have any other case? No, we, have we have one more. Okay. So she's a 72-year-old lady. She was operated uh, 12 years back by a right-sided TKR. And the only complaint that she had was uh, left-sided knee pain, and she was not able to climb upstairs with the right knee. You can see that the right knee is bobbing up. Uh, so she had got clinical instability. I said, we will not operate the left side. We need to address the right knee. So on a standing x-ray, you can see that there's metal on metal uh, articulation, indicating that there's a polywear or a polyfracture. Uh, you can see some notching there. The implants appear to be well fixed at 12 years. So the plan was essentially, uh, she was negative for infection. Plan was uh, to be a straightforward revision. This is an instability medial laterally, as well as anteroposteriorly. So this was a PCR knee. Uh, most probably her, her PCR is also gone, along with the polywear. So uh, this is was uh, expected with a metal on metal articulation. A lot of, a lot of metallosis. Um, uh, so this was the situation we explanted the device, uh, the implant. We were lot, uh, left with a, a cavitatory defect, not a segmental defect. Fortunately, we did hybrid cementing. So this was the uh, uh, Exitec uh, constraint controller design. So we did some hybrid cementing. That's what we, we cement the metaphysis fixation with cement. And then we had the rod in. So got a well-managed knee with a constraint controller design. So this is the follow-up. This is three years now. No complaints. I hope that we are able to manage her. So I guess balance is everything. Even if we do an RHK, uh, it's still worthwhile putting in a spacer without having the hinge placed in and looking for the, the balance in flexion and extension. And then I hope we have a good outcome. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you. Now, before we take into the workshops, as we have a very glittering front row here, I think we have talked a lot about the alignment and all, all that and the balance, but we haven't really talked about what mediolateral balance we are actually aiming for and how do we want to aid the knee. So if I can have a give, give a mic to Ashok Rajgopal. So do I have a mic? I saw that the knee was going into hyperextension. So just quickly, when you're operating a primary knee, do you want it to just come to neutral or a touch of hyperextension? How much do you want it to open medially? How much do you want it to open laterally in an ideal case? Uh, great question, Evan. Osteoarthritis for extension. Rheumatoids, started with flexion contracted. I don't mind about a five degree contracted at the end, they stretch out. So now I use the medial contour for all my cases now. Snug medially, two to three millimeter relaxity across range from zero to about 65 seconds. So no hyperextension? No, never hyperextension. If I can ask uh, Sanjay, I, yeah, I, I really don't think hyperextension is something I would think. Okay. It needs to be corrected. Um, please. Yeah, I also won't go for a hyperextension. It should be zero. Or if it's a flexion contracture, no hyper extension for me. I like a one to two millimeter extension, both medially and naturally. Keep the same stability one to two millimeter all along the arc of deflection for the medial side. And I like to have some opening naturally 
on the left hand side, as shown by us uh, by, by C. Owen this morning. And I love to use the MC as well for that because it's to me the more natural. So, uh, I always use some, some sort of technology for that. Genius. So, the gas or robotics uh, assessment is a little bit different. So, you have to leave it in around five degrees of flexion because it's looking at the center of the heat and the center of the knee. And if you were to leave it in zero, it's probably five degrees hyperextension. So never hyperextension. Only exception, as uh, Sir said, is if you had a stiff rheumatoid with thick flexion deformity, then you can leave up to 10 degrees of flexion at the end of the cell beam as long as it's well balanced. And I wouldn't accept uh, too much laxity. In extension, it would be balanced, maybe a millimeter back on the lateral side. And in flexion, maybe two millimeters back. Uh, one more issue is weight collection instability. So, can you enlighten on this your opinion, all the experts? Yeah, so uh, there are two situations where you will get weight collection instability. If you have uh, elevated the joint line by more than four millimeters or so, uh, then there is a possibility, and it is more commonly seen with multi radius uh, female components. And if you've done a superficial MCL release for some reason to balance the knee out. So if we find uh, that the release uh, and with the robotics, we can see that, that it's you know opening up in the lift and it comes sometimes we have done too much of release. I think the only option is to avoid it uh pre-operative intraoperatively, and if you end up with it, maybe increase the constraint to balance. Right, with this. I think we will conclude this scientific session here. I thank everybody for attending in such large numbers. Hopefully, this will be the beginning of such conferences that we will hold. Uh, a special thanks to Ashok Rajgopal for guiding us. and getting a glittering international faculty and really widening our horizons as to what is possible in knee replacements and what is happening. Weinberg here has been a workhorse in still standing. And some of you may not know that after the demonstration cases, he had kept a few cases as standby and the ethical person that he is, he finished all those surgeries as well. For attending the banquet, uh, I uh, thank the international faculty, mainly Sir Parrish, for being here and uh, really guiding us. And I'm going to let out a secret, which is probably not very appropriate here. I asked him that if you were to operate your mother-in-law tomorrow, what would you do? What do you think is the answer that he gave? He said he would do a conventional knee replacement. <laughs> I said first that I will send out to you. <laughs> that was my first answer. That was the first answer. I couldn't really say. That decided one. So, so, so the thing is, the thing is that techniques and technologies are there, but as Ashok pointed out, that we have to use our own brains and we have to sharpen that robo as well. Uh, what about some concluding remarks? So, so I, first of all, you might both of you here. I think this course wouldn't have been possible without. <laughs> Maybe I will not be possible with, without the support of three or four more people. Absolutely, uh, Sonal, who is our department secretary, Gaurav, Lokesh, and Shah. Now, so there are numerous people whom, if I continue to name, I'm sure I forget many of them, but they are always there in my heart. They will always remain as you in my heart. So really thank you. And before you leave, before I can't take anyone all the names, but I've put in a video that all of you can enjoy. There are some glimpses from the days that we spent yesterday. So thank you everyone once again. <laughs>
Thank you, everyone, for being there and encouraging us. Really, thank you. And please join us for the workshops now. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, the lunch shall begin at uh, one thirty. I'm not sure now because we are delayed for the workshop. Thank you. Thank you.